There we go. Ooh. Lovely. All right, I think we're ready to get started. All right. How many folks are here? 21 right now. Oh my goodness. All right. Well, very good, good Friday to everyone uh, on this Zoom on this gorgeous day. I'm Cheryl Torsney. I think you know that. Welcome to this. We are we are really thrilled. This is the culmination of um, MTSU's $100,000 OER grant, Embracing Equity Through Open Educational Resources. We promised this showcase in our grant. So this is sort of the end. Uh, we, are, we are wrapping up this particular grant cycle because some of you already have grants for the third cycle. So yay, that is, that is so wonderful. Um, we're excited. We've got lots of presentations. We need to stay on schedule. So uh, let's go. Okay, um, I'm, I'm Erica Stone. I was on the steering committee and we've got many of our steering committee and, and faculty advisory council members here in addition to um, in addition to many grant teams. So we're excited to hear about what you did with, with the money and how you're gonna move forward to be sure that your OER resources are sustainable. All of the presentations in this PowerPoint and in this showcase are from the Embracing Equity Through Open Educational Resources grant, um, which has been a two year uh, labor of love, I think is safe to say. Um, and uh, in today's presentation, we're gonna cover our long list of special thanks, um, a quick definition and benefit summary of OER. Um, we're gonna have lots of people talk about the impact of the fall 21 and spring 22 cycle one grants. We'll congratulate those who um, have won cycle three grants. Um, we'll talk about um, the, the different projects and what they've done. And then if there's time, there will be a short opportunity for some Q and A and some additional sharing of OER resources and a little discussion about um, what we're gonna do to continue to sustain this effort. I'm continuing to paste our links in the chat um, of all of our resources for today. So there's a schedule with time checks on it, just to be sure that we stay on time because folks are gonna be jumping in and out of this, of this very long showcase because they, they wanna come in for certain, pe certain people's um, presentations. So it is sort of syndicated in that way. Um, and so that's, that's the purpose of staying on our schedule. And I'm gonna let Cheryl um, talk through all the folks that we owe our thanks to. Absolutely. Um, so please know that the Office of the Provost has been on board since day one. We presented to the Board of Trustees, oh golly, like three years ago, and we'll be doing a follow-up to let the board know what in fact we have accomplished at the, um, at the meeting next month, in fact, on May 24th. So many thanks to my boss, to the rest of the folks in the Office of the Provost, the Office of Research and Sponsored Programs. Um, folks have been with us since the get-go to. Uh, there's been some turnover there, and but, but that turnover has been seamless in terms of their support for us. The OER Steering Committee. Oh, and the OER Steering Committee, we are the ones who are the first ones with the t-shirt that I am wearing today. And I believe everybody else uh, who had one of these initial grants has a t-shirt. The OER uh, Faculty Advisory Council, who helped us with selections, who are also there from the get-go. <laughs> The LTNITC, all of you LTNITC people, you know how good you are. We could not do it without you. James E. Walker Library, never underestimate the sort of support and service libraries can, can offer. It's not your mother's library. Uh, these are people who are on the forefront of, um, of digital everything. And Madonna Kemp, OER editor, English PhD student. Thanks, Madonna. Who went through tirelessly on, on a couple of our texts line by line. So that was that was really helpful. Um, if you're just coming in, I continue to paste the links to the slides and our schedule in the chat so that you have those available to you. And for those of you who have been here for the last five minutes and you've gotten them 80 times, I apologize. Um, 
quick definition that, that we're using for OER resources at MTSU and uh, in this current grant and ongoing um, comes from Creative Commons. So we're specifically looking to create and sustain resources that are either already in the public domain um, or licensed in a manner that provides everyone with free and perpetual permission to access those resources. Um, Suzanne um, Mangum and I and, and several other people did some, some workshops on um, what it looks like to retain, revise, reuse, remix, and redistribute, and what the Creative Commons licensing looks like. And we anticipate the library continuing to sustain these efforts and give some, some um, instruction on what that should look like over time. There are many student and faculty benefits to OERs. I'm not going to read this slide to you. You do have access to the slides um, in the, in the um, chat. I just want to make sure that we move on and stay on track on our timeline. I do want to make sure that I have time to talk about this particular slide, and this is the financial impact of our grant. So I want to remind you that we were only offered a grant of $100,000. So we had a big return on our investment in terms of student cost savings for both our 15 faculty grants that we offered in fall of 21 and our spring 22 um, five bonus grants that we offered to some grant teams that we're gonna hear from today. So we in the fall, we saved an approximate $84,000 and in the spring, $69,000. And there are some assumptions being made that I noted at the bottom based on these calculations, but um, so it's, it's a significant cost savings to students. And as the cost of tuition continues to rise, this is a really great benefit um, and include in, and really encourage a student success in all of our courses, um, both at the gen ed level and at the major level. We had three grant teams go on to win um, cycle three grants from TBR. So um, we're gonna, we have over $80,000 in additional grant funding for English 1010, elementary education, ooh, E E S E 210. I'm not sure what that course is. If somebody wants to come on their mic and tell me what it is, please do. Introduction to education. Um, oh, that's us. Um, yeah, yeah, it's uh, EESC 2010. Um, that's the introduction to education um, course and the applicable practicum, which all students that are going to be either special education, early childhood education, elementary or middle level education are required to take this course uh, prior to being admitted to their specific program. Very good. That's awesome. And then our COM 2200 team also got a tier 2B grant. And so if you're interested in what the tiers are, you can go to the TBR website and check that out. Um, but we'll continue building, uh, building those grants and continue um, sustaining OER here at MTSU. I'm going to drop these links back in the chat one more time. And we're going to move into our presentations and talk through all of the things that you've done over the course of the semester. The schedule is, um, is in that chat now. And then I'm going to do a quick time check. And it is 11.08 because I'm talking very fast. Um, so it should be, it should be, um, it should be 108. It's 110. Um, and so that means that Joan, you have a little bit of extra moments maybe to, to talk about the Wikipedia FLC. And just for context, for those of you that um, are new to this project, we did fund through this OER grant two FLCs that were intended to support the development of OERs. And this particular FLC was one of them. Okay, so uh, Wikipedia for scholars and students, you'll notice immediately that there is a two-pronged approach here. One for scholars, scholars uh, because I was hoping to convince our faculty members, and I think I successfully did, that it is up to us scholars to make Wikipedia a tertiary resource as reliable as an encyclopedia should be. And to that end, we looked at articles and we edited them and we made them better. We added resources. We sometimes corrected how things were presented, the writing, um, et cetera. But also the second um, approach to our, our study, our uh, efforts was to teach students too how to um, how to use Wikipedia first, and secondly, how to use Wikipedia to create knowledge that then would be openly accessible to people all around the world. <clears throat> so um, we talked about different assignments, 
and how those assignments do things like teach writing skills, how to write objectively and in a neutral voice, um, how to do research, finding and curating reliable resources, putting them together, and then how to use technology um, to, uh, to put all of this research and writing together and then launch it through Wikipedia on the World Wide Web. Um, and so we crafted some, uh, some assignments. We had one bold member who decided to go ahead and try it out in class, and he was very pleased with his results. And um, we're, we're still working on launching our own article, uh, Wikipedia article, which we hope to finish at the end of the semester. And um, we hope to keep on working together to share with each other different assignments and what works. We were hoping to have an edit-a-thon, but the members of the committee, uh, funnily enough, as professors, they were much more tentative about being able to teach others how to use Wikipedia immediately. And so we've decided to put that off until maybe next year when they feel more confident. So those are our results. And I think I have also finished up a little bit early. Well, do you want to tell us um, about your feedback? I did put in the feedback to the slides that you that you requested. Yeah, sure. The feedback talks about the learning modules. We also had the cooperation of WikiEdu in this project, and they provided us with a series of modules so that faculty mm -hmm. members could learn how to um, how to use Wikipedia and how to add to Wikipedia, edit Wikipedia, et cetera. Um, and these are the same modules that they can have available for their own students when they decide to use um, a Wikipedia assignment in the classroom. So that's what these are um, mostly talking about. And then uh, the second one, um, so we talked about the range of opportunities and this second one, uh, is talking about the experience uh, one professor had in implementing an assignment into his class and, um, and how it was, he found, really productive. It was a graduate class. That helps too. Um, so they were, they were quick to catch on. Um, I have used Wikipedia assignments in my classes now for about five years, and I am always pleased with the results and get really good feedback from students that they are they are thrilled that one they get to show their parents that they've been published internationally and then two they uh, they know that their work is not just going into my file cabinet so um, that's yeah that's really exciting Joan can you um, tell us a little bit about what your article that you're working on with the FLC is going to be about. So we're we're um, trying to put together some um, possible assignments so that we can present present those to people, and they will uh, those who read it will feel more comfortable taking what we have worked out as an assignment and then just being able to apply it in their classrooms. So that's what we're working on with our, art, with our article. Okay. And then you mentioned having an edit-a-thon. Are you specifically gonna be working on that article or are you going to go in and edit particular Wikipedia pages based on what you find disciplinarily? Oh, when we do the edit-a-thon, that will be, it's mostly targeted right now at faculty members to show them how simple, really simple it is to edit and mm -hmm. add sources and make an article better. So our plan is to lure faculty members in to a space where we'll be sitting like spiders <laughs> to get them to share with us what articles are relevant for their research 
and then immediately on the spot, get them to improve the Wikipedia articles that apply to their areas of expertise. Okay, so I have a little bit of a prickly question. Okay. Um, what kind of resistance have you encountered about Wikipedia as an OER? And, and how have you, how, what kind of conversations have you had around why Wikipedia is valuable for scholars and students and why we should begin to integrate it into our academic and um, pedagogical practices? Yeah, we certainly talked about that the first day. And um, students always remind you that their teachers have taught them never to use Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. And yet, of course, we all know that when you Google something looking for information, the first thing most people do is read the Wikipedia page. Am I wrong? No, you're not wrong. Exactly. So we worked through that the first two um, sessions. We talked a lot about Wikipedia in its um, early stage, mm -hmm. in its current state, and what our responsibility as experts in our fields should be to make it better. Because it doesn't matter if you dissuade students and others from looking at Wikipedia, they're gonna do it anyway. So it's really up to us to make it the resource that we want our students to be looking at. So th that's the good word that we hope to also share when we do the edit-a-thon. I hope you're able to share it. Um, certainly within the English and writing studies discipline, there's a whole cohort of people that spend a lot of time um, engaging in editing Wikipedia, not just about writing studies subjects, but about all kinds. About um, all kinds of stuff. That's right. Yeah. Well, Erica, maybe we can work together and work something out too. That sounds exciting, but but maybe in like a couple months. <laughs> yes, not right now. And that's the that's the pushback I'm getting from faculty members in uh -huh. my group. Is that everybody is, you know, above their eyeballs in work right now. Yeah, Todd said in the chat, we use Wikipedia authoring and editing assignment in the interactive media 3060 writing for interactive media course. Oh, super. One student created a Wikipedia page for her hometown of Saudi Daisy. Excellent, excellent. That is really exciting. Um, okay, we're at 118, we're a little bit ahead of schedule. Does anybody have any other questions for Joan about this particular FLC or any other comments or questions about Wikipedia before we move on to our next showcase? I was just gonna say, I really like this. Um, I, I have discouraged students from including Wikipedia in their academic research papers, however, I have told them it's a great resource for background knowledge written at a level I know they'll be able to understand. So when they get into journal articles that may be written and are written, right, more for a PhD audience, they'll encounter things that they may not have a lot of background knowledge on and going to Wikipedia to quickly build some background knowledge, I think is a good strategy. And then I have told them, you know, certainly there are times in college level writing where Wikipedia, I would allow it depending upon the the uh, assignment, but this assignment is asking them to find peer-reviewed journals. But again, they're written many times well over, um, sort of over their heads, right? Because they're in getting a bachelor's degree. So I think it's mm -hmm. very, very helpful. And I Wikipedia all the time when, when my children are talking about popular culture, I'm like wikipedia trying to keep up with them. So yeah, I use it all the time. <laughs> Excellent. I'm glad to hear that. And another, um, another project that we talked about, I had um, several language professors in our group, and we talked about using this as um, using Wikipedia and other languages, and then one of the assignments being translating awesome. into, in order to enhance the article in English by using the article that's in the other languages. So yeah, there are all sorts of possibilities. That is really exciting. And Cheryl said in the chat that WVU, WVU used to use Wikipedia in residence. We used to have a Wikipedia, Wikipedian in residence in the library. That's cool. Well, so we as did we too, move, sort of. Yeah. And as we move um, OER um, maybe further into the library, that's something we can think about. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. All right, Angela, tell us about um, EESC 210. Thank you, Joan. Uh, hello. Um, so I wanted to share you just a little bit about our work with um, EESC 2010. 
Um, the members of our team are myself, uh, Dr. Jana McLean, who also works in the College of Education and teaches uh, one of the first courses that they take after this class. So we're really looking at building program coherence um, uh, you know, across classes in the College of Education. Uh, we're also working with uh, Angelica De Silva and Jennifer Grow, who are um, in our PhD in literacy program and have taught the EESE 2010 class. So uh, this summer, so coming up in the main semester, um, Dr. McLean and I will be piloting the, the press book that we've created. Um, what we did in this first cycle of the grant was um, take multiple resources that I had been using in the class because we've been playing around with the idea of OERs prior to this and sort of putting them into one place so that it was more streamlined and accessible for students. Um, replacing videos that we didn't like, uh, removing text that didn't align with what we were looking at, um, and really looking for um, resources and things that had uh, a critical lens. So next steps you'll see here were to apply to the uh, OER tier two grant, which we have done and received. So we're super excited. Um, so this summer, uh, what we're really looking at doing is um, analyzing the, the press book that we have created within this first round of the grant work uh, using a rubric that's focused on looking at diversity looking at diversity really, and then creating an outline of which, you know, are there perspectives um, that we're missing? And then we're we uh, also working with Dr. Karen Reed from uh, the curriculum library here at MTSU. And um, she is gonna help us to find some resources with those diverse perspectives. And then uh, in July, we'll also be attending the PD. And then in August, uh, looking at creating um, assessments, both formative and summative, that can be embedded into the press book uh, using H5P. And so Kim Godwin has also joined our team so that she can help us with the technology piece. So that is where we are at. Okay, so, so far, some of the things that we uh, were thinking about was, um, and to what extent does the content within the press book align with the course objectives? We were looking at choosing material that would set them up for success uh, as they progressed in the program. So, uh, for instance, we're introducing the idea of UDL, um, which will connect directly with their special education courses and the idea of funds of knowledge, which will connect directly with this um, ELED course that they take after this. So the feedback that we're looking at is just the student experience. Um, how accessible is the resource? How usable do they find it? Um, do they feel that it's coherent with the objectives that we have for the course? And just what is their overall experience with, o with OER? So that's where we're at. That's awesome to hear. I have a quick question. So you were awarded the largest grant of cycle three, and um, that was to include open educational practices in the creation of your press book and in your um, in your resources. So yes, for those of you who, who are not familiar, open educational practices involve students in mm -hmm. the creation and editing of OERs. So yes. I would love for you to talk a little bit about what that's going to look like for you guys in next steps. Yeah, so um, as I said, we'll be attending that professional development in, in July. And then there's particular things in addition to having the students um, help us to actually write and edit the press book. There's also the idea of students having choice in the way that they're demonstrating their learning, which we feel like right now this course is has like three overarching modules. And so that final module task uh, looking at it, expanding on the way students can express their learning. Uh, the other thing that it talks about within the OEPs is, is really being inclusive of different perspectives, different backgrounds, different authors. And so starting with an analysis of, you know, who, who is represented and who is not represented within the press book draft that we have. Um, mm. So yeah, that's exactly what's going on there. Does that help? Yeah, that's super interesting. So um, introduction to education, is that something they take prior to admission to teacher education as a degree? Yes, program? it is. Yeah, yeah, this is traditionally been 
traditionally been what I would call the gateway course, mm -hmm. which makes me super uncomfortable, um, <laughs> really uncomfortable. So finding a way to have students have voice in what they're experiencing, the way that they're demonstrating their learning, uh, those things feel really important to me. Um, not just because the idea of a gateway course makes me uncomfortable, but also because in education, not just in education, but in education, we really are looking to increase. Um, I haven't published it yet. Um, increase, uh, look, really looking at increasing the diversity of teacher candidates that are entering, entering the field. And so having, um, having, having them see themselves from the get-go in education is really important. So, yeah. Absolutely. Um, we got some comments in the chat. Joan, you answered Joan's question. She was asking if your press book was published. Um, for it's those of not, you- uh, Actually, my next step is to reach out with Kim. I see that she's here. Hi, Kim. Uh, to put a time on the calendar to say like, okay, um, hello. Like is the best, I'd like to say publish it now so that we could use it, have students writing on it and do those sorts of things in the summer. And then, but I don't know if this is a horrible idea, but then as we move to the, through the next steps through this next grant, um, that needs to be ready for next spring. So is it a horrible idea to publish and then publish again? Um, and that's certainly not a question that has to be answered now, but reaching out to Kim Godwin is on my list. Awesome. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with press books, um, you can create a press book and it, it doesn't have to be public. And then once you're ready for it to be public and searchable, um, both within our own library database for MTSU's press books account um, and also on Google for when people are looking for things, you can switch that access to public. And um, press books is a, basically a WordPress site for those of you that are familiar with WordPress. Um, and you can always edit, as Suzanne yeah. said in the chat, you don't, you don't have to worry about that. Edits happen quickly um, within Pressbooks and they're automatically live. So if you find something that needs to be fixed, it's super easy to do. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, yeah. So, so thinking about Pressbooks as an iterative thing, I think is really important. You just um, have to make sure you press the save button. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, Madonna, you're here. Did you hear us? Did you hear us uh, sing your praises? earlier that is the one part i missed dang it oh, i'm okay, sorry y'all i have the flu and my daughter has the flu so i'm gonna leave oh, the no. camera off that's okay but. madonna is our superstar press books editor so we did we did sing your praises earlier and i'm sorry you have the flu um all right awesome i believe katie gruber is here to talk with us uh, thank you angela and congratulations on your on your new grant thank i'm you. excited to see how that how that goes um, Katie is here to tell us about COM 2200 and their pilot and ongoing work and to talk with us about, um, about their new grant. Hey y'all. So our class COM 2200 is the general education course, the public speaking course that all students must take to graduate. And our project began, I guess, last summer. I'm is there something up with the slides? <laughs> That's okay. What is something going on with the slides? Okay, no, never mind. It was probably on my end. I'm sorry. So, okay, it was on my end too. So you're okay. Okay. Oh, anyway. What's going on? Are they not showing? No, it's good now. We're good. Oh, weird. Okay. It was just kind of glitching. Not a problem. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> um. So let's see. So our team started curating materials last summer. And we pulled from three different open educational resources. One was Lumen Learning, one was University of Minnesota's Open Textbook Initiative, and then one was a press book. And so the Natanya, L'Oreal, and myself, we all piloted use of OER in our COM 2200 classes in the fall. And we shared a course shell on D2L together uh, like we, that we created over the summer and it had all of our modules, all of our reading, our articles, our videos. And um, that included things even like links to our National Communication Association page, things like that. And um, we copied that to individual course shells and used it in the fall. And 
we knew that this is a top 10 predictive course. It's even the most, uh, I think, highest enrollment of all the predictive courses. And so we understand and really knew that, you know, it's important for students to have instant access to this, to have that equitable resource. So we were really excited to start this project, but we did face a little bit of resistance. And so we wanted to assess our efforts on this. And so we took our 11 sections that were using OER and compared that with I believe 16 sections of those using the standard textbook. And this is a standardized textbook that is used across all COM 2200 sections. Um, it's been used, I think, for about a decade. And we decided on this as a department. So we wanted to make sure we were comparing and we were seeing the benefits that we knew to be there. Uh, we had a, a little over 400 students, I believe, that were um, surveyed. And we had really great results on this. Uh, our pre-test, our post-test um, showed that students had really negative views of purchasing textbooks. You know, I mean, obviously no one likes to spend money, uh, but students are, you know, facing issues with tuition. They're facing, you know, a really expensive textbooks. And when you require this class, they have even extra negative views. Um, some said they were anxious, they were stressed, they were overwhelmed. And one even that we've quoted several times is that they're hit with a wave of dread. And so, you know, we can understand that perspective. You know, we don't like to spend money either. Um, so there were a lot of um, negative comments about purchasing textbooks. And so we knew that that use of OER could really benefit them. But we also saw this really interesting differentiation between uh, major courses and requiring textbooks and gen ed courses. Typically, what we saw was that students, for one, don't like it because of that financial aspect, but they don't feel like the textbooks they're using for the gen ed course are useful. Uh, they said things like, I'm only going to use it for one semester, and that's even if the instructor uses it. So that usefulness theme kept coming up. Um, and another thing they mentioned was, well, you know what, the major courses are useful, not just for the class, but for my future. So they saw the value in the major textbooks, whereas the gen ed books really didn't show that. So um, we got a lot of really good feedback from our students and um, lots of positive feedback. You know, they didn't, uh, they appreciated that they didn't have to spend money and they liked that it was online. They appreciated it, you know, being virtual and digital. Uh, they liked saving money. And even the faculty that used it, uh, Natanya, L'Oreal, and myself, we really enjoyed seeing, you know, our students happy. And we saw that students were getting a lot of out of it. Um, our pre and or our, sorry, our post tests um, surveys showed that the, the, uh, the courses using OER had more, sorry, I have a note for myself. <laughs> they read it more closely and they read it more often. And they saw that benefit of having OER versus those that had the traditional textbook they didn't read it as closely. So we saw students getting, you know, more out of the material <clears throat> and students really appreciated not having to buy. So um, we did get a little bit of negative feedback about all of the, uh, the links that we had in our modules on D2L. And so this spring we received the I guess cycle two mini grants and we uh, put together a press book and so I have been working on that since January, uh, putting that together, all the uh, material that we adopted previously and, you know, comes from Lumen Learning, again, um, the University of Minnesota Open Textbook Initiative and another press book. We also put in some original work and hoping that it's pretty much done. <laughs> and I think we're kind of in like the editing stages. These are some screenshots of the press book I created. Um, our team has been reviewing it, editing it, and we're hoping that actually next week to show it to the department faculty. Um, 
so that we can either use this in lieu of the textbook, that is our standard textbook, or use it to supplement so that, again, we can save our students some money. Um, there's so many great public speaking OER texts out there, um, but we saw that adopting several of those and putting them together was kind of clunky. So we wanted to streamline that a bit more for our students. And that was why we created this press book. Um, and then just to talk a little bit about cycle three, uh, Natalie and I are going to be in the fall um, using, hopefully using this press book and getting our students to share their own uh, speeches. And that way they get to not only you know, create the press book with us, but they get to share their stories because humans are storytellers and public speaking is all about sharing of yourself. And that's something that I really push my students to do in my public speaking class. So we want for them to be able to share those stories with us. So that's a little bit about um, cycle one, cycle two, cycle three of the grant and our OER creation. Did y'all have anything to add, Natalie, or if we have time? No, you have you have time. I just hit the wrong button. You're good. Unless, um, <laughs> I'm happy to answer questions if Erica has any for us. And but Katie, I think you covered it all. Yeah, and I would just like to say it's super evident that you guys teach public speaking. Um, <laughs> excellent, excellent cadence and um, knowing exactly what was on the slides and taking notes. Um, I will say that I was really delighted to see. Um, that in the quotes from your student feedback that people were joyous. That's really exciting. And I had the pleasure of, of looking at some of our feedback data alongside Natalie Hoskins, who was on your team as well. And so I was able to see some of the other feedback that came along with it. And you guys, not only did you have a lot of student responses to your pre and post surveys, but you also had really good responses to the things that you were using. So I was really encouraged to see that. And I'll just note that you were the only grant team out of all of our grant teams that received cycle one, two, and three grant funding, which is really exciting. <laughs> yeah. Um, and some of your team members are, are um, commenting in the chat that you did a great job and the book looks beautiful. Suzanne says the book looks beautiful and it does. Um, Thank you. And then uh, Natanya said, Katie did a great job putting the book together. So does anybody, I know a lot of your team members are here. Does anybody have anything else they wanna share? talk about <laughs> I'll just add I'm looking forward to presenting this next Friday we do have a faculty meeting and we are scheduled in the agenda to present these projects as um, as persuasive argument to convince our peers that um, we'd be doing a disservice to students if we didn't change our current model for the textbook so <laughs> it's a little scary but also I'm very excited. That's really exciting. I hope you guys are, I know you're gonna be successful in your presentation, but I hope that they are persuaded because what you've created is really, really exciting and um, would be a great adoption for your students program-wide, I think. Awesome. Um, so we're, um, I, I put a time check in for myself here because this is right before, um, my own presentation and my and I believe my director Kate Panelides is here and she's going to help me out with this but I did a time check since I knew that I was going to be talking and I could talk more quickly if we were not at 140 um, but we are so that's good um, so um, Kate is here and Kate feel free to jump in when you're when you want to um, I'll turn my camera on for this part I was trying not to do that while others were talking we are um, we worked on a grant for cycle one, and we were also awarded um, a cycle three grant for a separate um, English composition course, English 1010. And we were working with, um, with a team of graduate students, as well as um, full-time lecturers and tenured and tenure track faculty to both create this OER for English 1020, um, and also um, pilot it across a large swath of English 1020 classes, both dual enrollment um, and honors, as well as, um, you know, our traditional 1010, 1010 and then our um, 1010K that comes along with a workshop. So we have a variety of student populations that are using this text and giving us feedback on it. 
Um, before I talk about sort of our plans for the future, um, Kate, do you want to talk a little bit about the history of textbooks in our department and how we moved from our current text to this one? Sure. Thank you, Erica. Um, so we have um, long had a default textbook um, for all of our Gen Ed English courses for our 1010, our 1020, and then our 2030 courses. Um, we had selected those courses, um, those, those books, um, with a lot of faculty input. So um, we had a couple of folks read a gajillion books um, and, uh, and then bring a few to our um, faculty. And we gave everybody desk copies to spend some time with them. And then we voted on the books that we felt were sort of most representative of our curriculum. Um, and then we have had a custom component to our texts. So um, we have an introductory, a pretty hefty introductory chapter that talks really specifically about our program and student success at MTSU. We also have award-winning um, essays from our gen ed English classes. So um, because of that structure, we, we had, um, uh, there was also a royalty that came back to the program to support student awards, um, faculty and graduate student travel, um, and our professional development. So we, we've had sort of this history in the department um, in the relatively near term of a default text that had faculty input that was really customized to our program. Um, and because so many of us um, were using that text, so again, we're using this in 1010 and 1020, which are the, the highest population um, highest enrollment classes at the university. Um, because of that, we were able to sort of negotiate with publishers and, um, and bookstore to get those um, prices down as low as possible, but they were still relatively high and represented um, uh, problems for access in terms of access for some of our students. So when we started talking about OER, we still wanted to maintain that customization for our program. We really also wanted to ensure that we were using peer reviewed materials that represented best, best practices um, in the discipline. And so we started looking at OER. And we looked at a lot of OERs. We <laughs> spent a significant amount of time um, on Kate's beautiful back porch um, with dogs playing in the yard, if you can picture it, um, examining text and determining if we wanted to create our own OER text or as the COM 2200 team um, discussed, adopt others and bring them in. So. Um, our initial grant, cycle one grant, um, was divided into sort of three ways of thinking about OER. Um, adoption, which is just wholesale adoption of a text. Ad adaptation, which is changing pieces of it or creating your own. And um, initially we were looking for things to adopt and then we started to, to adapt and then we decided to create our own and it grew into this really long um, summer project that we did alongside graduate students and um, others in the program. So um, our 1020 text, if you export it as a PDF, is over 300 pages long. We're working with Xanadu to um, print that out for folks so that they have a print text as well. Um, and then in addition to continuing to pilot and revise the 1020 textbook, um, we are trying to apply for a course fee or figure out a way to continue that revenue stream so that we can continue offer, so that we can continue to offer the kinds of professional development that we have been able to offer in our department. But I will say that um, we're super excited to work with uh, Xanadu for the fall 22 semester for printing purposes. Our previous default text for 1020 was $65. And so the Xanadu text, which is the print version of our OER, um, is going to be about 13 or so. So that's kind of nice in terms of cost. Um, and then we did get some great feedback from students and from faculty. Um, Particularly in our dual enrollment classes, it's been nice to have a text on the first day of class. Dual enrollment students often don't purchase the book at all or have a hard time accessing it. And so OER texts has been, having an OER text um, available for 1020 has been super helpful. Um, and we've certainly seen that within the spring 22 semester specifically, uh, which is when we offer most of our 1020 courses um, at the dual enrollment level. Um, and then thinking specifically, as Kate noted, about how this text curates and links out to other peer-reviewed texts within the writing studies discipline and enabling us to curate and to still um, provide insight on our MTSU first year writing program and the kinds of course sequencing that we ha have and those types of things, um, but also linking out to um, other OER publications that sh have a shared copyright. So writing about writing and other, other um books in the discipline are linked in our text and described um, within each of the introductory pages. 
And students um, gave us some good feedback and said that it was easy to use and easy to access because it's often not in every class, but often in many classes embedded in D2L with particular links. And then two of our piloting professors were testing out how it worked in perusal so that they so that their students could annotate the OER text as they read it, which was super interesting to hear some feedback on. Um, and then students told us that it helped them keep track of the course content um, and then thinking about how those readings align with projects. So um, specifically thinking about how readings align with um, with genre projects and those types of things. Um, and again, it does allow us to, to think with students about, um, we're replicating some of the custom content that Kate mentioned that is existing in our um, previous default text. So Kate said we had at the beginning a really sort of detailed um, overview of the program and sample student essays. What we've done instead, since we're, we have our second grant now to, to create a 1010 OER, um, which is the course that precedes this one. Um, what we're doing is, is lifting our student sample essays out and putting them into another OER text that we're calling the Gen Ed Magazine. And we're gonna be versioning that and printing it and offering it to students um, at, the, at the first day of class so that they have an opportunity to see exemplary text, not just from 1020 or 1010, but from um, 1009, 1010, 1020, 2020, and 2030. Um, as well as any multimodal projects that might have been created across those courses and giving students the opportunity to see the kinds of texts that they might write um, and giving faculty the opportunity to encourage students to, um, as Joan said in her presentation about Wikipedia, think about who their audience might be and not just other students, but if you have a publication in mind or a venue that you might see your work outside of the classroom, that can be really motivating. And then on your screen are just some screenshots of our press book. Um, and we have about three minutes if we want to answer questions or if Kate, you have other things that you want to share. I'm happy to, to I, I feel like you should you shared all the things. Um, I mean, I think we're just really excited about the potential um, scaling up um, of this work. And, and I do think it's worth saying um, that there are complications to OER. And I think that as we're thinking about scaling up again, because um, the class is such a significant, such a large class, and so many instructors teach the course. Um, there's so much labor involved. And so that's one thing we're really trying to be thoughtful about um, to ensure that we're able to maintain a really high quality text yeah. um, because the publishers aren't doing all the work of editing for us. We're, we're doing that work and ensuring that we're um, selecting really high quality content. Um, so, so I will just mention that we're so excited, but we're also trying to make sure that we move forward and grow our OERs um, really mindfully so that we can make sure they're sustainable. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and Suzanne, we're happy to talk more about pricing. We, we, had, a, a, we had really exciting conversations with one of the Xanity Press reps. Um, Warren, I see that you have a question, but you, your voice is chipmunky again, I think. Yeah, you're Alvin today. But, but throw it in the chat. Throw, throw your, your question, question in the, in the chat, chat, Warren, because you, you got the Alvin thing going on. Y'all, when, when Warren comes to our meetings, we love it when he sounds like Alvin, because um, it's very it's very lighthearted and, love, and lovely. Um, so I do want to also mention, Joan, that um, so um, to the kind of conversation about um, the, the, the costs. So just a reminder that we have two different texts. So our really um, sort of robust text that students will be using for coursework um, is our 1020 OER text, which is about 300 pages. And that's, that's very significant. There's a lot of um, peer reviewed texts in there. Um, and then we have a separate piece, which is our Gen Ed magazine. And that is sort of a literary magazine um, that is all the award-winning Gen Ed um, essays from the year. And so faculty are invited to um, use those as model texts in their class to incorporate them. Um, it's also a great way for students to see their work published and to um, let students in those gen ed classes know that they, their, their um, essays could be published um, in the next year's gen ed magazine. So that text, which is relatively short, it's about only probably 55 pages, that text we think is gonna be about $13. Um, the other one, 330 pages, 350 pages, which might be more realistic of what most folks are doing in their kind of robust textbook, that's probably going to be more towards like 35 pages. Um, 
And Xanadu told us that there's going to be, or sorry, not, yes, not 35 pages, $35. Um, and Xanadu told us that there's probably an option to just do um, a three hole punch um, publishing. Um, so it's just paper essentially, and then students can put it in a binder, which is actually very appealing to me. Um, and I feel like there's some good opportunities to do kind of creative things and invite students to customize a binder for the class, um, or they can put a binding on it. So it just looks like, um, it's not going to look like a, the book that it would digitally. So I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. That's the $13 text is our kind of skinny little text. It's not our kind of robust one. Um, Suzanne, I have a long answer to your, question, to your question about copyright, and I need to be able to share something with you to answer it. So I'm going to have to answer that in a different space. And I want to keep us on time and keep us honest, and it's 151. So we do have to move on to the next presentation. But Kate can address some questions in the chat. And um, Warren noted that um, that it was possible to use the 1020 text um, with the D2L checklist function, which is really exciting to hear. Um, so Diana, you want to tell us about the PRST 3995? Sure. Our uh, PRST 3995 class is a required prerequisite for all of our majors. And then they go on to take PRST 4995, where they write an interdisciplinary uh, research paper. And in um, the prerequisite intro to interdisciplinary research, um, even though they were able to use the textbook for two classes, which we thought was sort of a value, we found many students were trying to get through both classes without the textbook um, because we specifically would say, you know, in this answer or refer to table um, four or 10 for um, the answer as you explore your disciplinary perspective. And we, we knew students were not um, always accessing or purchasing the text. We did have a copy at the library, but we are an online mainly audience with our students and so when this grant came up, we thought it's an excellent opportunity um, to explore changing away from a textbook that might put some students at a disadvantage that didn't have the ability to purchase it. And so the grant team members, I think Pamela McClooney and Renee Jones are both, I think, on today with me. And so they can feel free to unmute at any time or add to when I finish just a few um, prepared, a little prepared information. And then also Jonelle Hensey and Lane Bryant um, participated in this. And where we are is I've piloted this in my one section this spring, and we hope to implement um, all sections in summer 2022 of PRST 3995 using OER so the students would not have to purchase the textbook. And then our goal is to move um, PRST 4995 to OER. Um, and so we as a group um, began looking for OER for the different topics that we explore. And we had a lot of um, content that we could find. Information literacy is one of our student learning outcomes and we found tons of information on that. And we address academic writing as well, um, but we probably struggled a little more trying to find resources on interdisciplinary studies, interdisciplinary research. We did find some um, OER textbooks on that topic, but didn't really like them wholesale. And so then we went through and picked some chapters that we liked. Um, what our goal is um, for summer is to have all of this in um, H5P and D2L, because as I said, mainly we offer online versions of this class and even the on-ground sections use D2L um, for the content and assignments and things. Um, we, we were um, also fortunate to find articles on some of the topics we discussed, like we have a big emphasis on perspective taking, because we are talking about um, disciplinary knowledge, but then also interdisciplinary. And so we've been able to find some good articles and some YouTube videos as well. I would say that um, recently, Renee actually found a really great resource um, called Thinking Through the Disciplines, and that was through Lumen Learning. And um, uh, it resides within a resource called College, the College Writing Handbook. And there's going to be some other things we can pull out of that College Writing Handbook in addition to their um, sort of chapter on thinking through disciplines, which is a big piece of what we are talking about in this class. And then also we have always um, had a license in our, and used in our classes student lingo workshops where our students would go through a pre-prepared workshop on, on avoiding plagiarism, for example. 
and then they would submit their certificate of completion in the Dropbox. And there's some other student lingo workshops um, that maybe that are going to be helpful for us. There's a revision process and also a drafting intro, um, uh, writing body paragraphs and conclusions. And so student lingo workshops, because we're already licensing, licensing that, we're gonna be adding a few of those. And so overall, I felt, felt like we had to, um, a, a few people have said, there's a lot of OER on our subject matter out there. And I think we found differently that we had to really be creative to put it, pull it together. But I think we've been able to do that based on just the pilot this spring we had a program review and one of the students um, in my section participated in the student interview and the pro external program reviewer said, oh, one of the, the things that came out of that meeting is um, the student was so excited about the OER and not having to purchase a textbook. And so just a little bit of qualitative data there because we're not going to do anything formal um, in terms of polling our students or faculty until after summer to see, particularly the faculty, if they feel like um, we've gotten enough content in OER um, for the class. So I'll pause there and see if Renee or Pamela wanna add anything or if there's any questions. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so you had mentioned that your degree program is primarily online. Um, and so are you embedding all of your OERs within a particular course shell um, within an MTSU online master shell then that, that then gets duplicated across sections? Correct. Okay. And what is your process for versioning your OERs within that master shell? So what I mean is, um, do you have a process in place? This is something that I'm thinking about for our text and I'm sure others are. Do you have a process in place to check the links and to be sure that um, the other textbooks that you're using, those links haven't moved or the YouTube videos are still public or whatever it is? Um, or is that something that MTSU Online does with the master shells? I'm just not clear on like who checks to be sure these things are still working. No, I don't. Uh, and I know MTSU Online doesn't do that. And so I think it's going to be a, a situation where um, we're copying content and we're asking instructors, you know, it would be good before a module opens to, you know, click the links yourselves and make sure everything is, is still viable and valid and working um, as much as possible where we can. Um, for example, some of the OER textbooks we found where we're pulling chapters, we'll be pulling in um, some readings in a reading content module or submodule within the content. And so we, we won't necessarily be relying, but we will have several YouTube links. Um, we'll have links to our, um, some things like that. Whereas when we're using articles, we're going to actually put the PDF in there as a reading. But gotcha. that's a question. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm developing as an unfunded OER project, I'm developing an OER text for a professional writing course and I piloted it. It's an MTSU online master shell that's gonna be duplicated across instructors. And I piloted it this spring and I even just now finishing out my MTSU online contract, I'm finding that at least two or three of the links that I embedded, right, are broken already. Um, and so I'm trying to figure out what that process looks like, especially if I'm gonna be handing this course off to others, you know, um, that I either need to, build that into my process to check or, uh, you know, think about OBR maintenance if you're relying on other people's hosting. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pop in real quick. Um, There's one of the things Diana said about sometimes the link's not working. For the most part, when our, our courses are cloned, um, things are fine across the board, but every so often, mm -hmm. um, especially if it's been the same course clone um, over multiple semesters or sections, um, there will be an occasional um, link that doesn't work. And we're typically good about kind of going through, um, or there's usually a student when we give them, because we usually give them um, early access to the course, usually like a week before the semester starts, that someone will say, hi, you know, I clicked on this and it didn't work. And it's like, oh, okay, thanks for letting me know. And then we right. spread the word out to others, but it's typically not a major issue. Okay, that's good to hear. I just, now I'm, when something breaks, then I think about, okay, what am I going to do when it breaks again? You know, so. Sure. <laughs> yeah, but we already in our current content link out to several videos and in, in our discussions many times having some embedded videos. So we're sort of already dealing with this and maybe we have more links going forward, but. 
Yeah. Okay, great. That's, that's awesome to hear. We are at two o'clock. So I think we're going to move on to our, thank you, Diana and, and team. That was really exciting to hear about. And I know that online students in PRST 3995 are really benefiting from having um, online resources on the first day. That's really exciting. Um, who is here to talk about NFS 1240? Uh, Janet Colson is. Yay. And Diana, Diana, I agree with you. I save everything as a PDF because so frequently over the years, you know, when you link to it, so I've learned to I'll say things as, as a PDF. But I teach nutrition and the class that uh, we are working with is our introductory nutrition class, Principles of Nutrition, and it's a course designed for non-majors. What we have done is we took two existing uh, press books and we kind of cloned them together. But I, over the years, I have been looking for a free textbook for students. And back in 2014, there was a group of uh, dietitians who developed this book, and it was a flat world book. And if you can see the inside, it's a very boring black and white textbook. And I was so glad last summer when I found that the University of Hawaii had taken this book and developed it into a beautifully done, colorful uh, nutrition textbook. Their book was like 18 or 19 chapters long, which is, and it covered more information than what our textbook used. But then we also found that a group from Oregon had taken the Hawaii book and had downsized it to like 11 chapters. So we took both of the textbooks and we kind of remixed them. Um, uh, we're piloting it this year with, uh, it's actually with a high school. High schools throughout the state of Tennessee, they teach an introductory nutrition tech uh, class, and they are able to take a dual credit exam. If they use our materials, they can take a dual credit exam and get college credit for our uh, NFS 1240. So Leslie Mertz with Holloway High School is piloting the book this semester and her students will be taking the exam in May. Uh, last summer, we've been doing uh, the dual in credit for the past year, but we've also been doing summer training for high school teachers for several years. And last year I mentioned to the teachers that we were gonna be having this available for them for the 22-23 uh, academic year. And they were very, very excited. Uh, also, I did a, a session last July to all the state teachers in this, um, that teach uh, nutrition. And there's about 95 high schools throughout the state who teach nutrition. And all of those teachers were very excited about it. But uh, some of the things that I like about the book. First of all, the Hawaii book, they had a whole team, their whole nutrition faculty, plus graduate students, undergraduate students, and they had two copy editors who worked on it. And their book, at the end of every chapter, they have taken HP5, and they've done beautiful with graphics, different study quizzes that reflect on that little section of the chapter. Most of theirs are just fill in the blank but they're very interactive and students really like them. Then the, oh, the Oregon group, they did their end of the chapter uh, exercises and they're like multiple choice or click and drag. And I kind of liked those better because I don't like all those color, colors, but the students that we've piloted it with and uh, the ones who look at it, they really like the colorful ones. So what we're doing is we're remixing them and having a combination of both of those uh, at the end of the, the chapter. Another thing that I've found that I really like with the press books, and again, I've been looking for something like this for years, and I'm just really excited to be able to do it. Uh, but within press books, the table press. In nutrition, we have a lot of lists, and it will be like a list of foods and the amount of calcium, uh, sodium, et cetera, that's with those different foods. But with table press, you can do it interactive. So the student clicks the calcium and it will organize all the foods with the highest calcium to the lowest calcium. So again, that's one thing that we're integrating with the, um, the, different, um, with the different sections. Another thing that we've been spending a lot of time on is the PowerPoint notes that uh, at the high school level and also with our uh, university teachers. And I find that students really enjoy using PowerPoint notes, but we've been spending a lot of time developing the PowerPoint notes so that they coincide 
with the textbook. We, as I mentioned before, we are piloting it with the high school here in, in Murfreesboro. We will be using it beginning May. I'll be teaching the online class and we will be using it in that class. Also, all of the sections that are taught here at MTSU will be using this textbook beginning in the fall. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. One of the things that, and I created these for the high schools, uh, teachers, not necessarily for the, the college, but with each of the uh, chapters, I have created uh, study questions that the teacher gives a blank sheet as she's you know, discussing the topic with the students. She gives it to the high schoolers and it's kind of like guided notes. Um, I, I'm not sure if we will actually use this with college students. I'm gonna put these up for the online students this summer to see if they use them. But again, I'm not sure that they will actually use them. But when I first created them a few years ago, I didn't have the teacher guide, but then I have gone through and I've added the answers to all the questions in red for the, uh, for the, uh, for the teachers to be able to use. Are there any questions? Oh, one other thing I'd like to point out is I read a lot on phones and I believe that college students and also high school students read on the phone. And uh, one thing that I do is when I do it in the press book, I'll go over and I'll look at it on my phone to see if it's readable. And I have taken all the pictures. And if you have a, a, a photograph embedded and with nutrition, you have a lot of photographs. But I've found that if you put it on the side and if it looks good when you read it on the screen, it doesn't read very well on the phone. So I've centered all the photographs to the middle and it looks funny on the screen, but it looks a lot better when students are reading it on, on the phone. Any questions? <laughs> the, there's not a question. I did want to yeah. <laughs> make a note well, about yeah. centering the photographs is a really good idea. Also making sure the pixels are good, mm -hmm. that they can be enlarged for people with visual issues and using the caption function so that when it runs through an e-reader, it doesn't read as part of the text, which can be yeah. confusing. Mm -hmm. Now, that's another thing, uh, the problem that we ran into, and it's my fault because I was really interested in the Oregon book because it reflected the mainland type of diet. And the Hawaii book has a lot of the Pacific Islander uh, stuff, but the people from Hawaii, I mean, they had copy editors working on that and the way that they used their, they used the press book feature. So all of their end of the section, end of the chapter references use the press foot uh, uh, feature to put the footnotes in. And then the Oregon didn't use that. So we spent a lot of time trying to figure out, you know, how to, to, uh, to include the, the references. I personally prefer to use the press book feature so that when you click it, it will take you to the, the reference rather than handwriting that reference in. Yeah, that's- And, that's and that is very, time. very, very time consuming. There, there is where a copy editor would really be helpful. Yes, and um, so Madonna was our copy editor for several of the press books, and I'm hoping yeah. that we can continue to hire her um, as yeah. the state gives us funding for that, because Madonna, Madonna will go line by line through your book. Oh, really? Yes. Uh, as that soon as we find great. more money to pay her to do that, she will go line by line. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, and, and Madonna actually copy edited um, books for the state level as well this year. So she was oh, really? um, working on other dual enrollment texts. Mm -hmm. um, and Suzanne in the chat says, um, congrats, because this is going to make a huge impact on our state. And I agree, this is really exciting. Um, we can share Madonna, but we have to pay Madonna. We ran out of money to pay Madonna. <laughs> One last thing, one reason we're trying to, you know, I think everybody is trying to recruit more high school students, but I personally thought that by doing this textbook and having it available for teachers throughout the state, it would be a good way to recruit students and also so to have the MTSU embedded in it. So I try to put information throughout related to MTSU. Mm -hmm. And Todd said in the chat, um, just as a reminder that Pressbooks is responsive um, and does respond to screen size, which is really exciting too. Um, awesome. 
Thank you so much, Janet. This is such good work. And I'm so excited to hear about the pilot and how you're spreading it outside of MTSU as well. Thank you. Um, so our next team um, is gonna be talking about um, oboe and woodwind instruction. Um, are you here, David? I am. All right, great. Uh, so here at MTSU, I have a variety of different responsibilities and, and two of those is teaching uh, private oboe lessons. So a student comes in and works with me one-on-one, -on -one. Uh, but I also have to teach them reed making where I have to teach a young person and sometimes very young people how to sharpen a knife and scrape something for hours at a time. Uh, and the other aspect of that is I teach a class, uh, MUED 3310, Woodwind Techniques 2, where I teach young music educators how to learn to play and perform the oboe. And one of the issues is these students are gonna take that information and have to use it for the rest of their lives. And so the OER creates this ability to have uh, an endlessly re-accessible resource for them to use to keep up on what they have to be able to learn, what they have to be able to do, or problem solve. And uh, for my primary oboe students, uh, it's really created a, a function where I can hone ideas and draw in other resources in a single entity uh, and keep that uh, moving forward and moving out. Uh, so one of the things that's been really important for me is being able to uh, bring in a variety of different texts and a variety of different um, uh, exercises in this. So, for example, one of the things uh, that I brought in was uh, the International Double Reed Society fingering chart. One of the things that we have to do as instrumentalists is make sure that we can actually move our fingers in the right spot. And so we have these uh, organizations that help us with that uh, by having a variety of different fingerings and charts. Normally the book for that is about $75 uh, and imports from Germany. We have a copy in the library, but sometimes it's just so prohibitive for the students just to even go to the library sometimes. Uh, everybody's been mentioning about being online, and I find it's hard to get students just to go to the library even if they're here. One of the other resources that I've been utilizing is the IMSLP, or the International Music Score Library Project. This offers public domain music for students to be able to download and use. And one of the things I've realized over the years is a number of students uh, are buying the editions I recommend, but they're not as good sometimes as the 1860 edition, which is now in public domain, open, usable, and able to print out or use via PDF tablet. Uh, other existing companies often are trying to help students come back to them, just like it was mentioned with an MTSU graphic, uh, Fox, bassoon and oboe, they have a variety of not only fingering charts, but also things for helping music educators, making sure they don't over-soak their read, uh, methodologies, and educational components. Uh, one of the things that's been so important for me and what got me so excited about this uh, is the ability to utilize uh, my own uh, creations of uh, pedagogy. And so uh, this has allowed me to, st instead of thinking of what is the one way, how do I incorporate a variety of different techniques uh, and maybe you could, like I think of like an alpha or omega or a beginning and end. So there's not, uh, in music, there's often only one way presented. My goal is to expand that. And so I have uh, 18 steps to help students make this music instrument, which is nefariously difficult, logical, simple, straightforward, uh, as well as uh, introducing a variety of instrumental techniques. Um, and in my next steps, one of the things I mentioned here is the idea that my goal is to continue to develop and expand detailed instruction. So many of my students have specific problems and YouTube has been a great resource for this uh, to be able to reach students and be able to interact in a public forum and uh, so I found that creating a YouTube page called Oboe Speak allows me to give an hour-long video uh, in a common format that people can uh, absorb. They can listen to it faster or slower. Uh, they can pause uh, and ask questions whether they like something or don't like something or want more. Uh, and it's also opened up the realization that foreign language instructions are a really important part of this because there are so many musicians across the world that do this, but we all have a different way of discussing it. And again, in those very expensive textbooks, they have all the different languages listed there, but I think there can be a, a, a institutionally engaged way from a variety of my colleagues across the world to create maybe a unified database. Maybe we can go to the next slide here. Uh, so for me, the OER is, is an ability to organize my thoughts into something that is free and accessible. 
uh, and something that can not only affect MTSU and our music educators, but also as they go out into Tennessee, um, it helps them advance the education in their own programs. One of the difficulties with music at M in Tennessee is how not funded it is. There's very little funding going to it. And even the education of it, uh, my students only get four weeks with me. Uh, when I taught in Illinois, they had six months just on the oboe. But here we have four weeks, so I have to pack a lot in and be a continuing aid for them going forward. Um, so that was uh, So one of the things I noticed from this, the feedback is I was so surprised how much they loved pausing. I talk a little fast sometimes. I have a lot of details. I have a lot of information to give them. And they may not come from seven years of exploring or thinking in this kind of mindset. They may have had six months before they come here. And so it takes them a lot longer to be able to absorb that information. And so utilizing those external links and being able to access YouTube has created a really powerful resource for me to engage with not only my students, but a variety of other students. It also has allowed me to see what's important to them. What topics do they really want more of this information on? One of the things we do in class is work on excerpts and small pieces from orchestral repertoire. And they didn't want just specific repertoire, they wanted a method for approaching it, a maximum minimum method for doing that, which I'm more than happy to do. But also, uh, even though I'm very available to my students, having it 24-7 for them has been huge. Um, and, and any way that they can have more uh, checklists for that understanding. Can we go to the next slide? And so for me, one of the most important things is being able to expand and continue to build this, uh, creating more material and more specialized material. Also, I'm looking at engaging in uh, social media, not only of Facebook and YouTube, but also Instagram for picture, but more importantly, TikTok, because I want to see how, what's the challenge of how condensed can I make that information? It'll be entertaining because an hour long lecture will be condensed down to 30 seconds, but that's my next step is how can I make this more impactful and potentially gain more interest from younger students um, and then collecting more specialized data. Uh, the other thing is that idea of the international partnerships. Uh, some of these exist, but my goal is not only to make a Rosetta Stone-like opportunity to have the same concept explained, uh, but also derivations of those concepts with international flavors and choices presented. Most importantly, so there's not a diminishment of anybody, which often happens in a nationalistic sense within this artistic community, but instead an equal open playing field to discuss from a stable standpoint what's going on. Uh, and then also to cater the materials to a wider audience, especially younger students. The earlier and younger we can get uh, people in Tennessee to engage with this material means the faster they can learn, the better they can get, uh, and then access that really specialized high-level stuff. And to help students in high school and middle school access that information, what I'm gonna be doing over the next, especially year, two years, is really going out and reaching out and getting into more Tennessee colleges and more high schools and middle schools and showing up talking about this stuff, demonstrating the concepts, but bringing them back to this resource so it can have a, a, a cyclical kind of building of what are their issues, what are their problems, reaching them, having them access it, and then create more content uh, and organizing it so it, it tries to address as much as possible until new problems uh, uh, arrive. Uh, and also, I'm in just finishing my third year review so the international component allows me a way to organize more engagement with uh, national and international professors, as well as being able to engage with uh, uh, pedagogical institutions and students and new teachers throughout Tennessee and the Southeast, which has a real need for this information, but it's so hard to find it. And that's what's been so exciting to have this uh, opportunity with OER and just being able to have the thought process of saying, this is something I can keep building and working towards even after this grant phase and, and use for years and years to come because it, it fills so many of the needs of being a professor, but also being a part of the community for that service element of being able to engage and grow um, from the best place possible and putting MTSU in a light of, of a welcome wagon for all of that information and conduit for uh, growth. Uh, so with that, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to chat or answer, and, and, uh, and but that's what I've been working on.
I, David, I am very excited about your work. I think what you what I hear you saying is you're building in the scaffolding element that we often have to provide in the classroom that's not in a textbook. And I just love it. And I really want to encourage you to do an entire uh, oh my gosh. What is the what is the social media uh, channel you just mentioned? TikTok. TikTok. An entire <laughs> TikTok terrifying. textbook. Thank you. I, yeah. <laughs> a TikTok, TikTok textbook sounds scary, but I would love for you to, if you're comfortable, share your YouTube channel with us in the chat, because I know many of us would love to see what you're doing there. Um, <laughs> and I, I personally would, I would love to see the YouTube channel. Uh, we have to move on to um, to our second FLC now. So if we, if we can continue the talk in the chat about David's work and about the YouTube channel and any TikTok stuff, we're gonna move on to talking about OER badges and certifications. So I'll mute myself and let you guys take over. Okay, I know I'm here, Lucy is out of town. Um, so I'm Diane Edmondson. So I'm one of the co-facilitators. I'm not sure who else is on here um, from the FLC, but our FLC was really examining what open access badges, certif certificates and certifications. The start of this process was really going, we're trying to become more workplace ready, um, especially in the marketing field. And so what are out there, what badges and certifications can help our students become ready to enter the workforce, what will help them stand out from the crowd. And so what this FLC did is we first looked at research going, hey, we have these free resources and these badges and stuff, but looking at how important are they? Are they actually relevant? What is out there? So we did look at the research. We then came up with this comprehensive list where everyone took and tried to search for all the badges across the variety of disciplines. We had communication, we had marketing, we had your um, media entertainment. So we had a mix of, of ones there. Um, and so we try to come up with as, as comprehensive a list as possible. Of course, the OER list is gonna be changing as far as availability. We then created a pre and post survey so we wanted to so in the spring semester so this semester we decided to actually implement some of these badges and certifications in our courses so i for example added a sales management certification through hubspot into my sales management course and so we wanted to, to test to determine did students feel like they were learning something what was the looking at that kind of element so we created this pretest that we gave them at the beginning of the semester we're in the post-test now, post-survey part now. Um, so it's, this is still in process. And so obviously we haven't analyzed it to try to gauge the student's perspective as it relates to these badges, certifications, and certifications. Um, and so our plan is in the future is we're gonna analyze that over the summer and then to engage in some kind of either LT and ITC workshop or an MT Engage workshop. We've also talked about conferences that we may actually go present our results in the fall um, semester. Um, and so that's kind of how we did as far as the impact, many of our instructors did add these badges to their current semester this spring. So we're able to get that instantaneous like feedback that we wouldn't have done otherwise. So you want to next slide. So this was one of the feedback from the facilitator. Again, myself was one of them, but then Lucy was the other with it. It was worthwhile because of that immediate impact. Um, and so that resulted hopefully in what students are seeing is that enhanced learning. I know a lot of my sales management students posted their certification out on LinkedIn, and then that got shared and, and such like that. So they actually had those kinds of immediacy that they could showcase in the workforce. Hey, look, I've got this badge, the certification. Um, I know Lucy Matthews did something with um, in her class is for principals. And so we had a, just a mix of different ones. Some did Google Analytics certifications. So we had a mix of different certifications that were included, but that was from the facilitator. And then next slide. If you're looking from the participant side, um, this was just some of the stuff based upon their reflective papers that they submitted, that they had more knowledge. They got the certificate stuff. A lot of them going, I didn't know what certificates were out there until they participated in this FLC and then they found some that they're incorporating and they've implemented one of our persons, a communication person, and she did Toastmasters with some of our students and they've had really great feedback. Um, so it was just, this is adding to their toolkits and saying, hey, look, there are other ways that you can kind of engage 
and that a lot of students were eager and, and willing to participate. Um, and so that was kind of some of that instant feedback from the participants that in this FLC. So there was some talking about trying to continue this on and actually letting us finish out the study because um, April was a little early for that, but we are planning on finishing it out and submitting to a conference um, and then sharing that information with MTSU at a later date as well. So that was what we did for this last year with this FLC. Any questions? That's that's awesome. Um, could you talk a little bit about the alignment between OER badges and certifications and workforce preparedness and how students might translate that for external audiences? So in our, you know, if you start looking at workforce preparedness, like having those badges and certifications showcases that they actually have the tools that will make them successful in the workforce. So there's some things like the Google Analytics certification um, in oh, which... Yeah. It's kind of just expected that if you are in marketing and you're in digital media and entertainment, that you might have that certification. So you are helping the students prepare better for the workforce by getting them. This is something they could do on their own. Mm -hmm. It is a free OER resource. If they wanted to go out and get all the Google certifications, they could. But from experience, students don't necessarily voluntarily go ahead and adopt and take on the, these other things that are extra. Yeah, um, And so this kind of requires the students to, as incorporating into the class, it does then put it back that this is important. This is why you're doing it. This is, we're adding into it as the class element. And then it makes sure that they're then prepared better, at least better for the workforce in the outcome because they'll have those kinds of, of certifications. Cool. So I, I may have missed this. Um, where are they doing, is, is this like the Google stuff on Coursera or is this, is this internal to D2L? I'm sorry, I, I may have missed No, that. this is out, this is external. Okay. So it's one, so like my um, sales management one, like I said, that is through HubSpot. So okay. HubSpot is a free um, service that they have, a, they have a ton of different, they don't offer a lot of certification. Sales management is one in which they have certification. So students actually have to go through and watch videos. They actually have to take quizzes and complete assignments. And then they actually have to okay. take a certification exam mm -hmm. in order to get certified. Google Analytics is something similar. You have to go through the basic class and there's an advanced class and then they can sit for that exam. I mean, it's an online exam that they end up and take and then it gives them certification for a period of time. So they're all external to D2L. So all of these badges and certifications okay. are outside. That's why they are industry standards. Yeah. Um, and so that helps with the workforce preparedness. It's just these employers are expecting to see some of this kind of stuff. And so now we are incorporating them into our courses to make sure our students are better prepared for the workforce. Is this something that you would be willing to share with a wider community outside of your FLC? Um, oh yeah, like, I mean, we shared like the entire list. We've incorporated, we've sent that to several. I, I think actually we sent it probably to the OER as well, but I don't, I don't know for sure. I'd have to go back and look, but like we created an Excel file that has all of the certifications that we found. Mm -hmm. um, again, this is an ever-changing process. So we spent months mm -hmm. trying to find all of them, but that doesn't mean that there aren't new ones coming up every day. Um, and so, but we created this exhaust as, as exhaustive list as possible. So yeah, we had no problems with sharing that to, because multiple programs might be interested in the Google Analytics certification. Yeah. Or uh, sales management, probably not. <laughs> I can't imagine. There's a lot of other people that are interested in that, but there's an international marketing one that we found, and there is a nonprofit uh, management one that we found that, you know, are actually then immediately got adopted. There's mm -hmm. communication ones that we, that, so there's a mix of badges that are out there for a wide variety of, regardless whether it's industry specific or class specific, or just broader like communication. Everyone needs to be able to communicate. And so they yeah. can earn that badge. Yeah. yeah, I would love to, I would love to, I'm sure maybe it's in my email and I just don't know it. Um, uh, I'll take a look for that. And then I think we should definitely put that on our website and talk with um, maybe career services and other places about how that can get uh, more widely publicized across programs and to make your Excel spreadsheet an OER in and of itself, I think is a really good idea. Um, okay. I'm not asking you to do that. I'm spitballing <laughs> ideas, <laughs> uh, but I think that's a, I think that's a great plan um, to translate that for wider audiences because I've been teaching LinkedIn learning and those certifications um, in my professional and technical writing classes. And since our students have free access to LinkedIn learning and those certifications show up automatically on their LinkedIn profiles. Um, but I think this is a great additional resource um, that I know we would want to publicize either in an OER blog or um, something else. So 
Thank yeah. you for your work on this. No problem. Thank you. We have one more minute. Any other questions or thoughts about OER badging and workforce preparedness? Cool. All right. Thank you so much, Diane. That was really awesome. And just to be clear, I was not assigning you a task. I was just saying like, this would be cool if we could do this. I wasn't saying like, go do this. That's not what I was saying. Um, very sensitive to that. Uh, History 2020, who's here to talk about this? I. Awesome, take it away. We collectively serve a very large group of students uh, who are taking a history requirement as part of their general education curriculum. And the scope of our work includes online students. LaShonda particularly targets those students who are enrolled in the History Department's READ initiative. Jay and Lisa and Becky are our experts in that field. And then in addition to my on-campus classes, I have a couple of dual enrollment sections. One is online and then one is um, in class at a local high school. And so you can see that we have a very large variety of students who are not necessarily representative of the um, majority of the student population at MTSU. So we were incredibly excited about this work to see how OER might be tailored in ways to meet the needs of this diverse student population while at the same time really emphasizing the importance of um, equity, uh, democratizing access to information, and then affordability, as so many people have mentioned. And another team also mentioned the importance of having textbooks. I think, Erica, it was your team who mentioned having a textbook ready for those dual enrollment students when they walk in the door and one that they can um, access easily through different online platforms. But so what we did is we worked together to essentially reimagine History 2020, which is the second half of the US survey for non-historians. That means really 1868 and you know, reconstruction into um, as close to the modern era as we can possibly get. We each have areas of specialization, which made our work incredibly collaborative and exciting because we were able to bring our own strengths and resources into our discussions. So we divided the survey up into different topical units that were chronologically organized. And LaShonda created a D2L shell that we called our sandbox because we truly believed that it was a place where we were getting to kind of create and play. We selected an online textbook called the American Yop, which is also you know, a collaborative um, um, work with many people contributing to that and serving as editors. It's produced by college instructors. And it's an effort, again, to make historical information as accessible as possible. The American Yop includes primary sources, but we also found in putting together our own units that we were drawing widely from other OER um, opportunities that were so widely available online. So much of our work also included curating sources that would supplement the online textbook. One of the things that we found so advantageous about that process of um, curation and supplementation was that we could really speak directly to students' interests. We often survey students at the beginning of class to ask what they might be interested in studying. And they often list topics that aren't included in the typical or conventional history textbook. For example, sexuality studies is really pretty marginalized in uh, history textbooks. And so we were able to really incorporate materials in ways that serve the intellectual and uh, uh, personal interests of students who were enrolled in our courses. Um, when we were um, thinking about, you know, again, designing these units, we just, you know, realized that this was such a treasure trove of information with OER. And it also enabled us to think more creatively about how we deliver instruction in the classroom. So we were able to really challenge students who expected to come into a history class and they expected sort of expository instruction and rote memorization. History has such a bad reputation. Um, from that perspective. So we were able to incorporate lots of high impact uh, practices that emphasized collaboration and um, engagement, reflection, and that was a particularly exciting for us as instructors. Uh, I see that there are a couple of more people here from our team who have joined us. So the last thing that I will say before turning the platform over to Becky and LaShonda 
is that I found that because I could upload all of the links onto D2L, that D2L really became an extension of my classroom rather than a supplement to it. And a lot of the in-class activities that we were completing using OER, they could either be completed independently by students who were unable to attend course at the classes for various reasons, but also that this idea that we were collaborating in the classroom that we were accessing information that is just widely available and free that we could also through our collaborative work on D2L be part of that productive process. And so I now I'll turn it over to either Becky or LaShonda. Which one LaShonda, you or me? I can go ahead. <laughs> okay, I'm Becky McIntyre, so from the history department. And um, in this uh, grant, uh, we included uh, three of us from what's called the Reading History Initiative, which is um, a linked course that links History 2020 with Read 1000. So it is, um, it's for students who have scored a certain level at the ACT where they need, um, they need more help in the reading. So the reading class is directly linked to history. So they take reading first and then they take history immediately after. So nine o'clock is, is reading 10 o'clock is history. And what, what we've done is we've used, um, reading uses our, it's read 1000, they use our, our history curriculum to enhance the reading experience. So for us, this OER um, adaptation was crucial because we are, it is a very, uh, uh, it's a program uh, underrepresented, uh, so uh, at risk students, who often don't have the funds for, you know, for textbooks, it's difficult for them to get this. And so we were able to go right away and say, okay, you've got a textbook. We've loaded it up into, uh, we loaded up into a thing called perusal so that they could um, easily access it. And then um, the collaboration works so well in terms of trying to find different types of activities that we could use um, that weren't just textbook based. So we used no OER textbook, but then we used all these other resources in the sandbox that we created to kind of give students um, different experiences, not just read the textbook, take a test. Um, and I'm gonna have, um, LaShonda speak on this too, because I really liked one of the things that she had done in terms of creating videos that corresponded with, um, with the textbook, with the primary source, and all of it open access. So I'm gonna go ahead and send it to LaShonda. The, the one that you did, I like the one that you did on All in the Family, that's my favorite, but I will Hi pass. everyone. So I'm happily following my colleague, Becky McIntyre, recent award-winning uh, CLA <laughs> professor of student success. Uh, and um, would just say that Becky also provided a lovely terrace patio pool. And uh, <laughs> that's where we often met last summer. And that was lovely. <laughs> so um, it was really important for me just on a personal level because I'm new to MTSU and I hadn't even met my colleagues in person. And so this collaborative um, project was a way for me to connect with folks that I hadn't seen. And I, you know, I moved here and I didn't know anyone. So, um, but, Becky and Jen brought up this idea of how um, building outside the textbook is so important in our work. And one of the things that we um, have to do in history, right, is respond to real time changes. So as you may be aware, our state legislature is in the process of, um, or maybe already done, right, wiping out these um, um, topics that we teach, enslavement, history of white privilege, et cetera. And so we constantly, or the recent, um, I would call it interrogation of Jackson now on the Supreme Court, these things have relevance to what we're teaching in our classes real time. So um, when I'm teaching in 1980s and the rise of the new right um, in politics, I can point to a resurgence in um, the culture wars that we're living in right now. And 
working with OER allows us then to go straight to current texts and build texts as we go, um, which I really appreciate. Um, so yes, I see someone in chat is noting that the, the bill was uh, signed um, last week. Yeah, so something we think about a lot in my field, especially because I was hired to teach race, gender, and sexuality here at MTSU. Um, so this uh, OER model allows us to respond in real time and build off the content so that we can tweak it. I'm online, so I don't open my modules until a Monday, and I have time over those last little, you know, sort of days to say, oh, well, Judge Jackson was um, being um, interrogated for her position on the Supreme Court. This gives me a chance to link to Anita Hill's testimony, which is referenced in their text, but only in one sentence, right? Um, but Becky was also talking about, and I know our time is up here, I'll, I'll try to finish quickly here, just primary sources that I used to um, identify topics in the text, such as the situation comedy all in the family, um, which is referenced again in one sentence in their text, but I was able to upload full episodes of the ones referenced in their text so we could talk about race and housing discrimination. Um, in the Northeast during the 1970s and 1980s. And they can look at, at uh, these television series as primary sources rather than just reading about them in the text. I'll close by noting that we are all headed to uh, the Southern Association for Women Historians in um, June uh, to present this work. Uh, we're holding a workshop um, for historians on how to incorporate uh, these OER materials into the US history surveys. Um, and each of us will present a content module that highlights uh, the importance of women in US history. Um, so this was a great opportunity. And I know I'm done on time. I always go way too long. Thanks, folks. And thank you. I want to say especially thank you for us, you know, the five of us. This was such a great thing to be able to come in together, work together to build a team coming from different angles. So thank you for that opportunity. Thank you guys. I could I could talk and ask questions about this all day long, but unfortunately I have to keep I have to keep keeping us honest um, so that everybody drops in on the on the right time. Uh, but but definitely I'm going to reach out to all of you about that. That's a really interesting project and thank you so much for that work. Um, and yay for yard writing. Uh, CDFS folks, do you guys have uh, people here to talk about your grant? For an, I know we're back can you, here. Can you hear me, Erica? Can people hear me? Yeah, we got you. Okay, good. Yeah, so um, this, this is great. I'm actually the only one who was able to come today. Uh, my colleagues, unfortunately, had varying crises. <laughs> so, so I'll be, I think, the only representative here today. And I think, honestly, um, all of the things that the history folks were saying about being able to update the curriculum and integrate it with current events. Um, uh, really, like almost everything you said, we could copy and paste um, into our experience with OER because we and our program, uh, Child Development and Family Studies, uh, we're talking a lot about families and individuals and context. Um, how do policies affect families? What's the historical context of individuals and their development over the lifespan? And uh, how do their communities impact them? So we talk in my class, 4710, which, uh, which was uh, impacted by this grant, we talk about things like housing discrimination, racism, things like that as well. And so OER was really um, a really excellent uh, tool to make that curriculum really, we, call, we kept calling it um, a, like a living curriculum. Uh, it's dynamic. It's something that instead of waiting every year for a new textbook to come out or, you know, every sometimes every five or six years, like things are moving too fast uh, for us to wait for that. So we uh, really liked being able to update pieces of our course material rather than uh, being really dependent upon traditional textbooks. So in our uh, with our grant, we replaced textbooks in, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. And then I actually went around and did a six class um, and all of our experiences were very different. In fact, we did a workshop on this and I have the recording of that workshop um, because our discipline is um, relatively new. It's not a core, it's like a discovery major. 
and it's very interdisciplinary, there was not a lot of stuff out there for us. So most of us um, either were piecemealing together textbook chapters from other existing OER, or like in, for me and another colleague, we were, go, we were using the traditional textbook as like a concept guide, and then we were curating, oh man, so much material, so time consuming, um, to replace, to make sure that we had like a comprehensive course, but man, so a lot of our, we didn't, there was only, I think three out of the six courses replaced with like a conventional textbook. And then I know my colleague Claire is collaborating with someone at the University of Houston to make like a professional manual for people in our, um, in our field to help um, people navigate the professional world and learn skills and what jobs are out there. And um, so she's creating totally new content um, but me and my colleague, Jamie, we did this like piecemeal approach, which was super time consuming. And we learned a lot from that. And there's an entire other, um, like I said, workshop recording that hopefully the will be posted on YouTube soon. But if you'd want to see it, it's called Creating OER Where OER Doesn't Exist. <laughs> so if that describes your discipline and you'd like to see a copy of that, uh, a recording of that workshop, I, I have one and I can share that with you if you would just want to drop your email in the chat box. I can send it to you after this is over. Um, so we calculated that over the course of, of a student's degree in CDFS, we'd save them between 150, 100 and $500, depending on where they were getting those textbooks from. Um, and some, in some cases, we also created some new curriculum. Uh, let's see. So what we'd like to do moving forward, though, is kind of refine it. We feel like we kind of jumped in a little bit. We like bit off more than we could choose with this project. Um, we had, you know, all these courses that we were just gonna massive course textbook replacement and then there was nothing out there. Um, so we didn't realize just how much we were committing to. Um, and we'd like to figure out how to make the content we have curated publicly available. So for a class like mine, this gets a little tricky because so much of what I replaced it with um was not written material it was a lot of sometimes there were journal articles but uh sometimes a lot of them were videos um from various uh oh sorry my family is just now getting home <laughs> i'm gonna have to open the door for them um so i uh i had a lot of like youtube videos and other various uh material that probably have copyright on them and so doing you know, figuring out how to publicly make that available without violating copyright is kind of a quagmire. So that's something that I'm still trying to figure out. One of the things that we addressed in our presentation was if you are trying to piecemeal OER together, um, there's like a variety of sources that you can go to. And what we've done is we've created like a little diagram where it's about like student engagement, balancing student engagement with scholarly quality. Um, and one of the best sources that I found for curating really engaging but very scholarly OER is going to research centers websites and finding uh, videos or public education content that they've created. Um, so I, I have um, the centers on poverty that do research have really great videos to use. I do uh, information literacy. There's a uh, civic online reasoning has really high quality engaging videos for that. You can go to the next slide. Um, and so we have submitted our, just like the history folks, we have submitted our, um, our work together to, to a professional conference and uh, are hoping to, I have not heard anybody in our field talk about OER. Um, so we are excited about the possibility of planting this in other family science um, universities because we are so, as a discipline, we are very, um, sensitive to issues of equity, and we also are very sensitive to issues of representation, and that's another thing that OER allows us to do, is it allows us to um, hold ourselves accountable for whose stories we're including, what issues are we including, um, in fact, I, I would like to reference a, a, a suggestion a colleague of mine made is anytime you put a textbook in your course or writing in your course, put a picture of the author next to it. Um, so that it's a, you have a visual accountability of what kinds of scholars are you referencing and who's represented in the curriculum that you're using. And so having this OER 
allows us to uh, have very visual accountability for whose stories that we're telling. Um, so this is a quote from my colleague, Claire. She says, it provides a great opportunity to increase equity and access for all of the reasons you're all very well aware of. Uh, students had a, a, a positive response. Uh, it allowed our learning to be a lot more dynamic because it wasn't just reading hours on end, right? It was videos or activities and some reading here and we could really make it what we wanted to. Um, and then, but it was a lot of a time investment. Uh, we would have, um, we would have made a, a more strategic plan about how to make OER work um, in terms of the time constraints that we had. Um, but now that it's done, we're really glad that we we have it. And it's just a matter of how do we make all this work that we've done publicly available for other people in CDFS who um, for whom there's already so little content out there. So that's my time. Awesome. Very, very cool. And I love the work you're doing. And I like your, your segue and connection to the history folks, um, mm -hmm. majors that are so deeply invested in um, social justice and social impacts can really stand to benefit from OER. So I'm, and I, mm -hmm. I'm excited to hear about both of you, both of your groups uh, presenting your work at conferences. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, Matthew and Scott, are you guys here to talk about Math 1530K? I am. How okay. are you? Hi, good. Good. Uh, anyway. So, uh, yeah, so first, thanks thanks again for doing this. Uh, this has been great hearing all the different ideas and uh, listening to the last couple of groups. Uh, I think we're going to have a lot of overlap, uh, just like uh, Rebecca was talking about, with some of the things that we experienced by putting on the uh, OER uh, course. So uh, me and Scott uh, piloted a Math 1530K course. Uh, for those of you that don't know what a K course is, it's a prescribed course. So for Math 1530, this would be uh, students that have an ACT subscore uh, for mathematics that's uh, cert below a certain level, much, much like uh, they were talking about earlier with the history. Uh, so a lot of our students that we know come in are at high risk uh, and may not be accustomed to the, the rigor of, uh, of the college classroom they're been coming into. So one of the things that we wanted to accomplish with this course is to make this uh, OER version of the course as seamless as possible for when they, they get into the course. So what happens a lot of times um, in this course, we have to use uh, a software called My Math Lab, which a lot of you may be familiar with. And, you know, at the beginning of the semester, it's, it's a hectic time for them. Uh, and we found that getting that software and trying to understand how it works, uh, just getting registered, making sure their computer works well uh, with it. You know, Macs don't tend to work really well with the software. So we you know, had a lot of issues with that. So, you know, that just created a lot of uh, uh, unnecessary angst and anxiety for the, board, uh, for the students uh, that we felt just didn't need it to be there. And so that was kind of the catalyst uh, that kind of sent us down this road. We were thinking, you know, how can we get rid of my math lab? Uh, in some respects, and in addition, cut the cost. Uh, so when you purchase this book for this course, it's it's fairly expensive um, because it is the uh, book itself uh, as well as the statistical software that comes with it. Uh, but what generally happens is people end up using a calculator, a graphing calculator, and a lot of the students that we had uh, just weren't accustomed to using graphing calculators. So it was just this another hurdle uh, that they had to get over, and uh, the graphing calculator is just not how people do statistics. And so uh, we wanted to leverage something that was more aligned with how statisticians actually um, crunch numbers for statistics as opposed to using a graphing calculator. So that all of that was kind of leading us down this path. And this came at a perfect time uh, because we were looking at uh, piloting something uh, for using the, st the statistical software that we ended up using for this course. Uh, so what we ended up doing uh, is uh, adapting an OER textbook that was already out there. Uh, we really loved that. Uh, most of the content was there for us and it aligned with the course learning outcomes that were already set in place. Uh, we were somewhat restricted by what book we could choose because this course does have a common final. Uh, so we had to make sure that all of the different sections and things that were there were still gonna be aligned with um, the other materials that other courses would be using. Uh, so what we did with that, uh, we changed a lot of the wording, which was really nice uh, for me as the instructor of the course. Uh, I get to put it in words that I would use uh, as opposed to, you know, really statistical terms uh, that were just riddled throughout. We get to put in our own comments. So throughout the book, uh, you know, we had side notes where we would kind of give our own explanations of things, which was great. Uh, 
The other thing that it allowed us to do is to embed uh, videos. So the videos themselves were, were twofold. One, they helped explain how to use this, the statistical software that we asked them to purchase, um, how, how to use it for what was right there in the book. So it wasn't like they had to go somewhere else uh, or email someone. You know, as they're reading, there's a, you know, we'd have notes to say, hey, look, you need to click this video that we made. Uh, and it will talk about this or it will show you how to use uh, the stat crunch. That's the software that we use uh, for how to do whatever they're doing right here in the book. So you can see it in action, which is really great. Um, so we love doing that. And because of the comments and the videos that we could put in. And then, like I said, mentioned earlier, we were able to remove the calculator requirement. Um, like I said, because it was pretty cumbersome for the students to to understand how the calculator worked in the way that we wanted to, plus the statistical software that we used uh, gives visualizations with most of the calculations it does. So with the calculator, they would just click something that would just give them a number. But with this, we get pictures and you can you can take the picture and move it uh, or you can move the the boundaries of a graph region or what have you. So we love that. Uh, and then the other thing, obviously, is the cost. So I mentioned that earlier, but, you know, the book and the software that comes to package together, usually over 120 bucks, usually maybe even more if they got it new or if it was a new edition. But we were able to cut the cost to fifteen dollars uh, for the Stack Crunch software, which is cheaper than what they would be able to buy a used calculator for. So, you know, potentially they could have been using the book or could have been purchasing the book and a new calculator, which would have been over two hundred bucks. And so we were able to cut that drastically down. Um, so, um, in terms of uh, things that we would want to do in the future with this, uh, we would want to expand the homework. One of the things that we lost by taking away the textbook or the uh, my math lab was that we lost the homework component so what that good and bad uh, a lot of faculty use that because it's pretty easy to create the homework within that software uh, but uh, it also allowed us to personalize the questions so we created all those questions and put them into d2l so that was nice because everything was in one place and we got to personalize the wording of all the questions uh, which was you know a, a lot better we think than what you had uh, in, in my math lab Obviously, we're, we need to revise the book some more. There are things we want to take out, things we want to put back in. There are some other places that we need to put videos and things like that. Uh, and then we need to talk to other faculty about implementation. Um, one of the things we've got to get over is the Stack Crunch software. Not everybody's familiar with that. They're mostly familiar with calculator, but uh, we think that's a relatively small hurdle. In terms of student feedback, uh, we had a lot of good buy-in from the students. Um, as you can see, some of the quotes there, uh, a lot of them enjoyed using StatCrunch. It is a learning curve, but no more so than than what they would have uh, with with a graphing calculator. So uh, a lot of them enjoyed doing that. They uh, got a lot of good feedback on the videos being embedded within the book itself so they could just click it. Um, that was really nice. And we made that just clickable. It opened up to a YouTube video. So that they, they really enjoyed doing that. It was very easy for them to access. Um, and then you can go to the, the last slide there. So uh, faculty feedback, this was one of the things we were kind of concerned with uh, going into this. How would this affect what happens in the course? Uh, like we said, it does have a departmental final. Um, what was nice is I taught the non-OER version the year before uh, with my own final uh, because it was uh, COVID times. And then, um, and then uh, last fall uh, with the OER version. So one course and one course, which was great. Uh, and then you can see there that the, the final exam scores didn't really change, which was which was good. We wanted we didn't want to see that. Uh, we were hoping it would go up, but uh, obviously, you know, staying the same without having uh, for the, the students to have to purchase all those things. And hopefully we had better learning happening uh, without really any change. No change in retention. It was roughly the same. I think it was about 80 percent or something like that. Uh, and then what I really loved as, as the instructor for the course is that it created um, students to reach out to me. Because uh, with the My Math Lab, there are help tools that are embedded in there. So a lot of times the students go in there and they use those help tools to sort of learn what's going on. Uh, we can debate what, what's learned, but they would use those to, to kind of get through the homework. And what happened now is that the students would go into the homework and maybe they would have questions and it would spur them to reach out to me, which I love. Um, it, it really uh, saw a lot more engagement with students outside the classroom than I did in previous terms, which was great to see. And then obviously we didn't have any technology issues. Uh, you know, everything was there, everything was clickable in D2L. So uh, no no issues with the with the homework or anything like that. So um, I think that's, I'm pretty close on time. So I, I 
didn't know if I had time for questions or anything, but um, hopefully that gives you a good overview of what we did. I think you might have one minute for questions. And having seen Pierce in my math lab, I'm so happy that you're not using it anymore. It's, really, <laughs> it's wonderful. Yeah, 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 yeah. We, uh, or I really enjoyed the, you know, uh, not having to rely on it all the time. That was great. Yeah. Uh, uh, questions for Matthew? Lots of cheers in the uh, chat yeah. for you. Yeah. Yay. Awesome. Thank you so much to you thank and to you. Scott. All right. Joan, thank you for being patient. Joan gets to present twice today, and she's here to talk about their OER work on um, some French courses, all four of them. Oh, yes. And I, I Rebecca, I just wanted to say that I, I felt for you when you said that you guys had bitten off more than you realized. I felt the same way. Um, so we had been uh, working, we had been frustrated with French textbooks for a while and had already started talking about writing our own materials. Um, I'm sure that those of you who took languages in college remember the pictures of the old menus and the 20 year old um, publicities or ads and the fake dialogues and then the fake video that goes along with it. And all of that is so stilted and not real. Um, and in the field now, uh, there's a big push to incorporate authentic materials, authentic language. And that's what we really wanna do because we really want students to be able to communicate in various ways. And today with the internet, we just have so much more access than we've ever had before. And so we really wanted to take advantage of these opportunities. Um, so yeah, so first of all, we uh, for the level one, we were trying, I've been working on um, putting together the work that Anne and Jose and I have done sort of separately, but <laughs> Cheryl, you're making me laugh. <laughs> but of course, <laughs> Kim. Okay, so we're trying to um, gather all of our materials into a press book, which we will then use in 1010 and 1020. In the 2000 level, we got really lucky and hooked up with some folks at Virginia Commonwealth who've been working on putting together a, a press book and they shared that with us. So we have managed to adapt that and incorporate some really interesting, um, some really interesting resources into that, including uh, curating what we're calling curation or little websites where they will do a project and then incorporate videos and um, sound and uh, images and then do a little bit of writing there too. So they're getting to use all of the different skills, listening and speaking. Um, they can create their own videos. Um, so we're really excited about launching these two new press books and piloting them next year. And then you guys have all inspired me on ways to gather feedback uh, for how students are appreciating or recommendations for how to improve these, the use of these OER textbooks. So that is there we go. So, that is so exciting. And um, having taken French many years ago, I love the emphasis on real world and um, culturally responsive and interactive um, tools. So that's that's really exciting. And um, Kate and I can also relate to, to biting off more than you can chew. So I think, <laughs> you know, that's chewing, right. chewing slowly is okay. <laughs> it, uh, well, you know, it's just taken a whole lot longer than we thought it would. Um, uh, not surprisingly, when you go about things methodically and carefully, they do take longer. And we've run into some problems too. One is that when we copied over uh, the 2000 level textbook, 
it the H5Ps did not copy over. So oh. um, yeah, I think we're going to get to recreate those with uh, Kim Godwin's help, hopefully. And um, copyrights too are another issue. You know, you can put links and um, do screenshots into something that doesn't go out into the world. But when you're going to share it as an OER, you really have to pay attention to yeah. um, copyright issues. So those those are some of the other issues that um, that we are trying to work through. It sounds like we definitely there was a lot of um, chatter up about half an hour ago in the chat about a copyright workshop. So I think it sounds like there are about ten of us at least that could really benefit from a review of Creative Commons and. Um, a continuation of conversations now that we have created our texts about um, mirroring copyrights across Creative Commons licenses and then thinking about the issues that you just mentioned um, in embedding resources and, and where those limitations are. So um, we'll definitely work with Sheila on getting that together. It sounds like it's already in the works. Um, right, that would be Suzanne super, and super Kim helpful. And, and Suzanne and Kim just got their, their certification. So they're really your people. And Erica, another thing, I, I know that y'all have done one or two Pressbook um, workshops, but mm -hmm. I could benefit from, I think that Pressbooks offers a whole lot more than I have quite figured out how to use. Okay. So I would love that too. Sure. We can definitely do that. Um, Scott and I did a Pressbooks one. I think Scott and I can repeat that and then maybe offer some more workshop time rather mm -hmm. than just talking with you. Um, and maybe the Creative Commons one can be the same way. I'm going to stop my screen share. We're going to swap drivers. And speaking of Kim Godwin, she's going to drive our bus now. So um, take it away, Kim. Oh, you're muted. She's just one moment. <laughs> Is somebody in your office? No, nope. nope. that's a technology. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right, right. Got it. why, why y'all should not always rely on me for your technology needs is I can't figure out how to unmute Zoom. So mm. <laughs> it's all good. We've, we're figuring it out. Okay, so you need me to take over the share. Got yes, ma'am. Drive the bus. I'm going to try to drive it. Don't talk amongst yourselves while I'm doing this. <laughs> and this is Suzanne from the library. While she's while she's uh, getting things together, one thing I want to mention is it might be good to have a press books roundtable, uh, or maybe we maybe we could create a roundtable if we had a workshop on it. But sometimes it's like, do do we know what we don't know? Do we know? Where we'd like to go you know some of those like what what we would aspire to do like with um copy editors that we don't have but what can we do now to get those kinds of conversations yeah i think that's a great plan mm -hmm. if we did a copyright workshop one of the issues that i really the questions and issues i'm running into is to the extent I'm reusing existing work that is copyrighted, is there like how, how I need to know beyond Creative Commons, uh, beyond Creative Commons, what do we do if there's copyrighted work? Well, if we curate it, is there a way to like um, share our curated work in a way that doesn't violate copyright? Yeah, I think that's a question that we have had across um, many of the projects, and um, I think Joan's questions will intersect with with your questions in that way too. So maybe we need a press books roundtable, mm -hmm. but also a copyright roundtable where we talk about use cases because I think you can talk about copyright law all day long, but until you have a use case for it, it's not super helpful. Um, so that's a that's great feedback on our previous copyright workshop, um, and so maybe we can do another workshop or roundtable or something where we're working through particular issues um, and thinking about, as Suzanne noted, um, talking through and just kind of work, working through things around a table quite literally uh, and, and thinking about um, 
our real world, real world problems as we're encountering them. And Cheryl says she's taking notes. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to stop driving and let Kim drive. I think she's ready now. Okay. I'm ready. Um, I think MA is on somewhere to um, chat a little bit about this course. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm M.A. Higgs, and I would like to talk with you a little bit about our project that we did for PRST 4510 and 5510. Um, I had two amazing, wonderful team members on this journey that was uh, a very long year, and that was Dr. Mike Boyle and Dr. Kim Godwin. And as you know, she is literally the um, wizard of all things um hp5 so we were very tickled that uh i convinced her to join our crew um uh, the three of us have been teaching the prst 4510 in university studies it's a professional studies course and it's a wonderful course that really relies on content from one major organization and we found that the textbook for this course yearly was going up, 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 up in cost, and they were giving us less, less, less resources. So what initially started out as wonderful web resources and supplemental things suddenly became a small limited time use of the book and the price had jumped up to nearly $200 for one of the two course texts. So we thought, how can we do this? Again, um, because we're in university college, we have a lot of students that may have additional barriers to access for education with cost. Um, professional studies helps students who are either coming in for specific degree contents and helps them tailor their degree um, or come from non-traditional backgrounds and bring a lot of different educational uh, experiences, including prior learning assessments, and really coalesce into a degree that's applicable for them and their particular um, job and, and learning wants. So how did, what did we do? Um, we first started out by saying, how are we going to go about getting this book replaced? So uh, we started looking through the available uh, free content and I'll, I'll be honest with you, it was tough. Um, I've heard several people express that as well. You go in looking at the databases, expecting there to be a lot of content and realistically, there just wasn't. Uh, we in general found that a couple of controlling organizations seem to control the content for this particular course. So what are we going to do? Well, we started looking and the first thing that we found is that the second text which was not even part of the OER pilot, we were able to find a library accessible secondary text for free in multiple formats for our students. So immediately our second text, we were able to replace with library access accessible second one. And we started working on taking multiple text and putting them together to create this press book and choosing um, case studies along with actual content that could be used to replace what we'd already been doing. Now, this ultimately resulted in a complete course redo. We thought, oh, we'll be able to get some content, replace this, do that. It was a complete course redo. Every lecture, every single slip of paper from the entire course, every assessment, every discussion board, um, everything, even some of the rubrics, everything had to be completely redone to go along with this press book. However, what we found is that the press book in some way has been a lifeline for some of our students, especially during the pandemic. Um, we found that students like it, even though the content in it, some of it is a bit more dated in order for us to be able to find um, appropriate material. The students love having the free immediate access of the book that they can use in that course and, and later on. Um, We've also were able to use this book in another course. There was an emergency situation where uh, the text, the text for a separate course was suddenly not available. And so this, this was even used in a whole different course recently this year. So we had very positive faculty feedback. The students have enjoyed it. They've said it was great to be able to have a free textbook 
um, and are really enjoying the content. So we're thankful for it. Uh, the group is actually currently working on a second OER Pressbook for another course and hope to have that published um, actually very soon. So thank you, that's, that's where we are. How about my team members? Um, Dr. Boyle, Dr. Godwin? I think you did a great job of covering it. We had no idea what we were doing. Uh, we were uh, we were just desperate. We had to have a textbook because our students could not afford the one that we were using. So I'm very thankful to Emma for uh, allowing me to work with them to come. It's just a wonderful resource. It really, really is. A, it's a blessing for our students. We flipped the page now, and thank you for that, Dr. Boyle. We're so thankful that you did this for us. Thank you for being on our team. Um, this was really amazing, and I think our statistics truly do, as you see, speak for themselves. Now, we submitted our slide pretty much immediately after it was um, asked to be able to go. And so when we went to Pressbooks, you can find this information about your Pressbooks on the Pressbooks site. And right there, just in the fall, the very first time it was pressed out, we had 1,300 individual visitors with over 4,670 page views and 22 referral sites brought it in. That means different sites um, where it was accessed, used our book. We even have a group in the UK that accessed it and used it. So. If you'll look on the January 1 to February 9, look how the numbers just for this one small group worked. Um, and that was 712 individual visitors in, in less than a month. If you think about courses starting um, at the end of January, then this is 712 individual visitors in basically two and a half weeks of, of content. So it's not just MTSU students that are worldwide using our text. So um, you can see that this is a great thing and other people are using our text as well. Um, Dr. Godwin. I don't have much to add. Um, Y'all did a great job covering it. Uh, it really was, as everybody has said, an experience. And there's a lot of things because we really did a lot to push it out first um, to kind of model the way that we've learned from this, um, some things that we can do better. And we are working on some of those things to improve those. Uh, so recommendations for others, we have some of those too, um, as people are working on their press book, but it, um, it's easier than you think it's gonna be and also remarkably more difficult all at the same time. Um, so that's the, the one thing is make sure you're giving yourself some time to do it. And it is okay if it is not a thousand percent perfect the first time that you push it out. Um, I don't know about y'all, but, um, even my dissertation has errors in it and it was edited by like five people. So it, things are just going to not be a thousand percent perfect and that's okay. Um, so that's the, if that's the one thing that I can say about this experience and what this grant has given us and those opportunities is that it, it really is okay to give it a shot and give it a try as long as you aren't putting out just craziness. But um, that's my one thing from it is that we did learn a lot and it's been pretty awesome. And the students are loving that it's in there. Um, and we're hoping that with some other stuff coming up in the near future that things might be even differently integrated into D2L. So it's not an external link and fun stuff like that. So be on the lookout for new things coming. Thank you all for having our group. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk about PRST 4510 and 5510 and be on the watch out for another book that's going to be coming. Thank you, Dr. Godwin. Thank you, Dr. Paul. Thank you, Does anybody have any questions about the um, PRST 4510-5510 process or for any of us individually? Awesome. Okay. Um, oh, you're welcome, Suzanne. Check in the chat. You're welcome. <laughs> I'm glad that we could do it and we could do a little bit of learning to help everybody else kind of figure out ways to do it better. We're fine with that. Um, so glad we could do that. Uh, we'll go ahead and if nobody has any questions. We are uh, about a minute ahead. So we'll go ahead and move to the next one. 
We might stay a few minutes ahead. Um, I am presenting on behalf of this grant team. And um, I did just dig through my email a second ago to grab their OER, which is something they're producing on our website. So instead of using D2L or instead of using Pressbooks, um, this team who's working on actuarial science courses is um, embedding their OER resources within our website under a protected link. So that link should open up to their page. And I confess that I haven't, I haven't um, investigated this link past the link that gives you access to it. So I don't know where those links on that page go. Um, so explore at your own risk, depending on your fear and uh, level of discontent with actuarial science, which I um, am an English person. So uh, numbers are not my thing. So uh, I'll, just, I'll just read from their slide and talk specifically about the things that they have told me about their project. Um, this, this particular textbook was close to $100, so they're saving students money, they're saving significant money for students in developing OER materials for 5140 and 4140. And um, they are, they, um, in spring of 22, have their course designated as OER and pipeline, and we are continuing to work on moving those designations over to summer and fall of 22, that process is in, in, uh, discussion and, and um, Cheryl and I can talk more about that in different space. And these materials included curated materials from the web as well as lecture notes um, from various instructors. And that might be what's included on, on those links. Um, and they requested and received permission to use Society of Actuaries sample problems to be sorted and used in a, in a database and then also um, created OER homeworks and assignments to update existing materials. So I um, am sorry that they're not here to talk further about this project, but I did um, get, I did say that I would present what was here on this slide and I'm unable to answer questions, but I know that Vajira would welcome questions over email. Thank you, Erica, we appreciate it. Yeah. Okay, we are still running a little bit ahead. Um, so um, if are the individuals from the health courses, are y'all at a point that you are ready to go or do we need to can have a little chit chat, have a little moment with ourselves talking about whatever, it's up to y'all. We're here, we can go or we can chit chat, whatever, <laughs> we're easy. <laughs> I mean, I guess we can let y'all go ahead and go. What the worst thing that happens is we have more time for question and answers at the end, right? So, All right. sure, Absolutely. yeah, let's go okay. ahead and do it. Thanks, Bethany. Sure. Okay, so um, this first one, um, this is a progression of three classes in the Community and Public Health Program of Study. Um, and these classes build on each other, so the students take them sequentially, um, and they build, like, so the first is a needs assessment class, and after they conduct the needs assessment, uh, they go on to program planning and they build a program, design a program meant to address the needs that they discovered in the previous class. And then after they do that in program planning, they go on to the communication and marketing class where they learn how to communicate with their target audience and market their program effectively. So all three of these classes are um, extremely applied and practical classes. Um, we had been using one kind of big textbook for all three and just kind of breaking it down into three different sections. But we found that we were using it more of a resource and then kind of going out on our own for project-based learning for the actual courses themselves. Um, and so we kind of got to a point where we were like, well, I mean, if, if, if we're really only using it as a resource, wouldn't it be better to use existing resources that are freely accessible by students um, and that are also practical resources that they're going to be using when they get out into the field into the job market anyway. Um, so that's kind of how we decided to approach uh, this OER grant. Um, so of course, you know, being public health, we are very much interested in equity and increasing accessibility and all those things. So we very much resonated with that aspect of OER too. Um, but so in, in our meetings, we kind of approached it as for one, like I said, we wanted to make sure that we are incorporating um, resources for students that were very practical and applied. So like CDC and, um, you know, resources like that, the um, 
health data from the Census Bureau, the National Center for Health Statistics, those kind of resources, we made those available, put in links for students so that they can know what they are, know what kind of information they can find from those resources and then use them later on in their careers. Um, so we wanted it to be, again, be very, very practical. Um, but then also the other big thing is we wanted to make sure that all three of these classes are scaffolded in a way that makes sense to students. So um, we wanted to make sure that we weren't duplicating information, but that we were reinforcing concepts in an appropriate way as they were presented sequentially. Um, and that students were able to bring projects because like I said, it's, it's very heavy project-based learning in all three classes. So we wanted to make sure that students were bringing projects from a previous class and using that um, for the next class in the series. So that's really what we focused on when we were doing this project. I guess we're ready for the next slide. Um, <clears throat> so there were a couple of, of kinks and curveballs in this project for us. One was that we brought in a brand new faculty member um, to teach the first class in the sequence. And um, because it was developed with a different faculty member and then handed off to somebody else to kind of run with, there was a little bit of a learning curve there. Um, so that is something to keep in mind if there's not a, a like tangible textbook to use for reference, you have to be very, very intentional with communicating across faculty, especially when you're gonna be changing up who's gonna be teaching which classes. Um, and then additionally, we, and I think part of this, it was hard to tease out what was uh, resulting from OER and what was resulting from students just being kind of burnt out with online based learning in general period across the board. So I think um, we did kind of pivot and brought some classes to the classes back in a hybrid format for the spring. And we're going to be doing that with the additional class, the 4870 class um, for the fall. So I think because they are so applied and project based, having at least part of that in person, um, in addition to utilizing the OER resources, is going to be a positive moving forward. But even given those two pretty big challenges, the, the feedback from students has been really positive overall. Um, and it's good too that we can, we can, that the, the resources that we're using for OER, they're so, um, they're applied and in the field that students are able to focus in on what they're interested in and what, where they want to take their uh, future, what their future goals are, what kind of aspect of health that they want to go into, what topics they're interested in, um, and make it kind of personalized to their projects. So that's been good. Dr. Stone, what do you wanna add? I would just say, um, yeah, this, this project was great for, I think for our team because we were already kind of shifting this way organically and this helped kind of formalize our efforts um, and really bring it together for our students. Um, and, and like Bethany was mentioning, we, uh, using, uh, I guess we had, you know, with, I don't know, actually, Bethany, if you mentioned this or not, but we had a, one textbook that, that was really old, that was not being used very well, and we would sometimes reference it, but it had been in circulation, so it was really a cheap book anyway, so there really wasn't, the, the financial burden piece, it was there, but it wasn't as strong as you might have with some newer, you know, updated texts, and so we were trying to shift already a lot of this material to updated, um, you know, federal sources or national organizations that already kind of put together some different, maybe some training modules online, and, and we could kind of guide students through some of these. And so um, this, th that part really worked well, I think, for this project. Um, so on the student feedback side, yes, I think, it's def I mean, um, Bethany was correct in that it was definitely positive. Um, uh, but we didn't see the, the major, you know, 
relief, I think, that some other classes are experiencing with the, the cost burden. Um, though, though it was there, it just wasn't as significant, I would say. Um, and then uh, she's totally right in that I was one of the ones, I was the one that developed the material for 3320, the first one of the sequence, and passed it on to our new faculty member. So we had two challenges. We had a new faculty member that didn't know anything about D2L. <laughs> and then we had uh, this OER class that had a lot of moving parts. And so that, that was a double challenge, I think. She handled it beautifully though. Does anybody have any questions for the health group on this topic? It's really interesting that you had the one to carry across three classes. That's pretty cool. I like that. I was just yeah. going to add in that we had uh, one of our faculty members who ended up um, who tried OER and then she like had to actually go back to the traditional textbook. So it's worth saying that like it doesn't work in all classes um, or it needs to be like trouble, you know, you need to troubleshoot a little bit more and that's okay. And so one of the things that we recommended in our um, in our uh, workshop was that uh, you wait to do OER, especially if there's not an existing textbook out there, you wait until you've taught the class several times, which obviously you guys could not have foreseen, um, because you just have to already be really comfortable with what you want to cover and what's important so you can be kind of flexible. Flexibility is a great, great advice. <laughs> Okay, uh, we are 10 minutes ahead. Um, so um, did we wanna go ahead and talk, talk about your next one, health department? Uh, Bethany, are you on that one too? Or someone else in charge of that one? I am, I think uh, Casey Higginbotham is on here too. You may go ahead. Y'all can go ahead if you want to. If we need to catch up later, we'll we'll have question and answer time whenever we have gaps. So it's fine. <laughs> okay. All right. So this one was very, very different. Um, this is for our gen ed. This is actually the only gen ed offered out of the Department of Health and Human Performance. It's health and wellness. And we just kind of went for it. And it, instead of kind of going a piecemeal thing and piloting OER for one class and seeing how it went, we across every single section starting in fall of 2021, whether it was in person or online, every single section went the way of the OER textbook. So we found an OER textbook that pretty that aligned pretty well with what we were already doing. Um, so we, we implemented that, we adopted that, and then that also meant that we had to develop all of the necessary ancillary. So we had to develop all the quiz bank questions and the PowerPoints and all those things that you kind of get spoiled that come with a, a kind of prepackaged textbook that you would get from a publisher. We did ourselves. Um, something else that's a component of this class. So there's a lecture and a lab. And uh, previously with our previous publisher, we had customized a lab manual that they published along with the textbook. So we use Xanadu through the bookstore and we self-publish the lab manual. So students do still have to purchase the lab manual to do the labs with the class, but it's at a greatly reduced price. I think it's down to what, Casey, is it like $15, 20? Down from 100? Yeah, we were at 115, we're at 22. So it's a significant savings across the board for students. Um, so again, but you know, we, we took the opportunity to revise the lab manual. We of course wanted to make sure that it coincided with the new textbook and that they fit together seamlessly. Um, another interesting aspect I think of this project is that we, we included GTAs with us um, in the grant because GTAs are responsible uh, for teaching the labs that accompany the lecture section of 1530. So we really wanted to make sure that they were a, an integral part of the whole entire process that they had a say in developing all of this. So I think it was, 
it was a, a really, it was a learning experience for us, but certainly for them as well. That's something that, you know, when they go job hunting, they get to put a line on their CV that help, they helped develop a course um, and implement OER. So uh, that was a kind of interesting part of this. What else am I missing, Casey? So I was just gonna mention um, for us, it was really important um, to have, it's always been very important for this particular course to have consistency across all of the sections. It's a high enrollment course. So we regularly have um, 10 or more sections um, going concurrently. And you know we know students compare notes. So um, we want everybody to have as close to the same experience with this general education class as we can. So. Um, I think we tried really hard during the planning process for this to make sure that all the materials we were, we were creating could easily be plugged in. And we do have a master D2L shell that we share across all of the sections. Everything is already really organized um, and embedded in there that the students will need, including the textbook. Of course, in public health, we're really concerned about um, the timeliness of the information um, you know, we've all learned from the pandemic, public health is changing all the time, it's dynamic, and what was true yesterday might not be today. So um, the fact that we have a, an online text that can be edited um, is nice, and we can um, give input on editing as well, not just the original authors. Um, and I agree with what Rebecca said a few minutes ago about having taught the course multiple times before you adopt an OER format, um, because we have found this semester, and this is feedback from faculty and students, that the text is not as deep as what some would like in terms of covering the material. Definitely not um, the depth of information that we've had in past texts. So instructors that are um, have a history of teaching the course have been able to plug in um, information that they, and content that they feel really needs to be covered that maybe that text doesn't hit. Um, the flip side of that though, and something I really like about the OER text is that there's a lot of other OER embedded in it. So links to the CDC, links to um, all sorts of videos and um, you know National Center for Health Statistics, different resources that we want our students to know and learn about. So um, that's something valuable that we just wouldn't have in a, a printed text. Um, so I think that's my, my two cents there, Bethany. Yeah. So um, Casey already talked about some of the faculty feedback. And again, like a lot of people have said already, you don't have that lag time if a student can't afford to get the textbook and then you have to figure out how to, you know, how do you accommodate those students and, um, and all those kind of things, it's available from the get-go and it's online and all that. So that's that's good. Um, this particular one is available. I mean, students can order a printed version of it if they want to. They can also download a PDF and use that if they prefer. Um, so, so the feedback, again, like a few people have said, we're human. And so in the process, because we had to create all of the test banks and the PowerPoints and all that, there were typos. So finding all of those was a process um, and, you know, students were very gracious about it for the most part, uh, but I think we've caught most of those hopefully by now at this point. Um, let's see, <laughs> the comment about um, not having to carry around the weight of all those textbooks in a backpack, hauling all those across campus. I think that was an interesting piece of it. Um, there was, it was funny though, and Casey, you may want to, to piggyback on this. Some of the feedback from students was pretty funny, even though it's a completely free textbook. When we were getting student feedback, one of the complaints from a student was they thought the book was too expensive. So take from that what you will. I don't know. <laughs> um, but yeah, on the whole, it's been, it's been very positive. I should mention we have the book obviously linked right inside the D2L shell in a module that says, here is your textbook. Um, and we got feedback from just one student who also said, um, I don't have this textbook, so I can't answer these questions <laughs> about feedback. So despite our best efforts, um, we still evidently have a couple who 
aren't aware of the book um, or how much it costs, but um, I think we've had a, a pretty good reception from students overall. What questions does anybody have for health about any, either of their grant options or their books? And we'll take a second to do some Q&A too, if, if nobody has anything for health, um, because the next group aren't available yet. Um, so any questions on anything? I'll even turn my camera on so you can see me talking and it's not just this weird, like creepy nothingness with a voice. So it looks like uh, Suzanne asked in the chat if we, um, if we think it will continue, are we planning to edit or add to the text? And that is an excellent question. And to be completely honest, because the fifth, I'm assuming she's asking about 1530, because it's a gen ed class, that really depends on what ends up happening with the gen ed redesign, I think. We're, we are trying at this point because it's we're kind of waiting to see how everything goes. Uh, we wanna make sure, again, with the theme of flexibility that we are positioning ourselves to be very flexible that where we can kind of roll with how everything um, turns out with that um, to best accommodate student needs and, and any changes that might be coming into play. <laughs> right, Jeanette, we'll just go right on past that to the next topic. <laughs> Some opinions out there, I hear. <laughs> what other questions does anybody have about OER in general, about um, questions for um, health and human performance, about Pressbooks or H5P or any of those fun things, which I will, when we're all said and done with this, um, I will make sure uh, when I'm no longer the one sharing the screen. Um, so it may be later, but we'll make sure to get sent to y'all to the H5P that we created. That's the first day OER initiative resource that is public and that y'all can then edit. Um, within that, we'll also make sure that y'all get the instructions on how to log in and create your MTSU H5P account if you don't know how to do it. Um, so that you will be able to um, take it and copy it into your own courses and then make edits to it. Um, you'll need to clone it if you're going to make edits so it doesn't mess up somebody else's class because it's a live. Um, but we can teach y'all how to do some of that stuff. We can. Uh, are the um, management 3610? Are any of y'all around and we can skip to you and get back to uh, English in a little bit, unless y'all have other questions. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, let me, let me do some skipping. Okay. There we go. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I saw this, uh, um, news report the other day about uh, UCLA students that had some watches stolen that were uh, they were at this nightclub and they they had these watches and then they were followed from the watches and had their watches stolen they were $165,000 worth of watches for two watches those are not our students um, so we have can y'all hear me okay okay we have students um course, a lot of uh, first generation uh, college students. And so for principals management, typically, uh, we had been using um, books in the range of 100 to $150. And we had most recently gotten down to about an $80 book. Um, our problem is that uh, not everybody um, is buying the book. And because it's expensive. And so um, we were excited to see that OpenStax had a, uh, a free OER textbook. And uh, so we looked into it further and we, uh, through this grant, we made a commitment to um, 
utilize this OpenStax textbook. Um, what's nice about it, one thing that's really nice about it is that uh, they have an app. And so you could just get to it right on your phone, um, and which is really where students live. You know, students live on their phones. Um, and so uh, you could get um, you could get it on uh, um, Kindle or 100% free online, free on Kindle, or 100% free on your phone. Um, this is uh, a high enrollment course for the College of Business. All of our College of Business students take this course. And so our enrollment is about 1,276. Well, this last year it was 1,276 students. So normally it fluctuates between 1,200 and 1,300 students. Um, current textbook is $80 and new textbook is completely free. Um, so we're looking at uh, a one year savings of $102,000. Um, some things we looked at that, um, I think, uh, you know, some issues um, similar with the, what the health people had is that, um, you know, this is a, it's, it's a good resource um, put together uh, through the OpenStax Rice University network, um, but it does not have the, it is not as polished as um, an $80, $100, $200 textbook. And so there is, um, there, there are some gaps that we will need to fill in that were um, to kind of tailor the material uh, in the class um, to what we, what we would like to, to have. Um, but other than that, uh, we're, Pretty pleased. Um, we have to do a lot of uh, rework on our classes because, um, of course, anytime when you change from one textbook to another, the um, the chapters aren't in the same order. Um, this one is a little a little bit stranger than most in how it's laid out, but um, I, I it's still completely workable for us. Um, we're going to be able to have our students have complete free access in the palm of their hand on day one. If they want to get a paper version of it, uh, they could get a paper version through um, different resources. You could get one through Amazon for, uh, I think it's $35 for the paper version. If, if you like that tactile feel. Um, a lot of students that I've been talking to would would just rather have it on their phone, be able to look at it on their phone as they're going about their day. Um, and that's really all I got for for now. There's a picture of the app. It's you know pretty pretty clean, um, but that's about it. That's great. I'm still a little taken aback by the watches. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And they're they're UCLA students and and it's uh like wow, uh why why are they going to school, you know? Um but uh, uh yeah, it's it's crazy. It's a different world for me. That's great. Yeah. What does anybody have any questions um for management about this process it's a uh, that's pretty cool that it is an ebook kindle and iphone too um and that it loads the way that it does that's pretty neat i um, great that you were able to find an open stack that did that yeah i'm surprised you found the open stacks not as polished because they you know open stacks presents itself as being just the same as any other book following the same editorial process so that's interesting um well, people have different tastes. Um, we we struggled with this for a while, and we have typically we have um, you know ten to twelve different 
faculty members teaching the class. And so everyone has different tastes. Um, AACSB, our accreditation, uh, would, would like to have, you know, in a, in a core class, core business class as this, they would like to have us all using the same textbook. And so we used to have to make compromises um, on, on which textbook to use. And, and some faculty members were never happy unless you could, you know, the, the book was big enough that you could kill a small rodent with it. Um, but, uh, you know, so yeah, the chapters aren't as long and so they don't include as much material as, you know, a, a 40 page chapter. Um, so there, there is some just little uh -huh. nuanced thing. They do have a nice uh, reporting system for reporting um, typos and um, maybe incorrect um, or incongruent theories that, that aren't being presented the, the right way. Um, but for yeah. the most part, I've, I've I've not had, not seen a whole lot of problem with it. Well, $102,000 is, you kind of need a lot to argue before you'd say it's not as good. Is yes. That, yeah. Yeah. I was, I was actually one of the kids when I was in undergrad, I couldn't afford my $64 physics book. Uh, you know, we lived on a farm and crops blew down and we made zero money that year. And so it was, I, I'm, I'm there. I'm always advocating for for uh, cheap textbooks um, that that can get the job done, you know, without sacrificing a lot of quality. And it, it looks like OpenStax, and you know, they've got a lot of funding from Bill and Melinda Gates, and from uh, Google, and from all these other philanthropies, where they can be able to put out a good quality uh, product for and have it available for free. There was a question in the chat about um, additional articles and being able to supplement your OpenStax with articles and things through the library. Have y'all been able to do that or is that something you may or may not do or does that just add a little too much to the class? Um, yeah, we could we could do that definitely in the D D2L shell. Um, I... I, I, I don't think there is a way to do that and still have it available in the app form. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that uh, many of our students are just gonna be grabbing their phones and looking at it there. Um, but we could, we could definitely add on and we, we plan to add on some additional readings in certain areas. Um, to, to drive home some of the content. Yep. That's great. Any other questions for uh, management um, before we back up to English? All right, thanks, Dan, that was really great. Yep, thanks. All right, uh, Warren, I think you're up. Okay, um, first of all, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, you heard uh, Erica earlier talk about my chipmunk voice and uh, that can be a little disquieting when you're trying to chime in, in a department meeting or something like that and you sound like Alvin the chipmunk. Uh, <laughs> all of a sudden you lose your sense of gravitas. So uh, <laughs> glad that's not happening here. Um, <clears throat> All right, thank you all for uh, sticking with this uh, presentation. Uh, I think I'm kind of bringing up the, uh, the rear and I'm happy to um, uh, finish out the uh, day full of, uh, afternoon full of presentations. Um, I am working by myself. My name's Warren Tormey and I'm a member of our English department. And uh, a few years ago, I developed a course called English 3010 online. It was, um, it is a course that uh, deals with um, 
British literature, the origins to 1700. So it casts a pretty wide net. And uh, once we got that off the ground and running, I thought, okay, I can maybe uh, contribute another, my time to another course development project. And um, uh, since I'm a medievalist by training and somewhat by temperament, I thought our English 3400 uh, class might be a good candidate for um, uh, some online development. Uh, it would fill a need within the department because the class is required by um, our teacher licensure candidates and uh, has a place within our, um, our uh, major offerings and we're trying to develop an online major. So I started thinking about developing this class uh, for online delivery and then I started thinking about what I could use as a textbook. And I did some Googling and I did some more Googling and then I did some more Googling. And what I found was that there is no viable uh, textbook that deals with English or uh, early European uh, literature. Uh, and that could go back to ancient Greece through Rome and through the dark ages, all the way up to um, Dante and perhaps even Chaucer, who happened to die in the year 1400. So he barely slides in within the, uh, uh, within, barely fits within the time frame. But uh, uh, I started thinking, uh, okay, this is going to be a problem. And I was looking over uh, past syllabi, and I guess we've had four or five department members teaching this class in the last decade, and they're all very different. They're all very uh, interesting classes, but each faculty member was orienting the class towards their specific field of study. So we have somebody who's very versed in the appropriation of Greek culture and philosophy into later periods of literature. And he spends a lot of time in the ancient Greek world. And then we have um, an Anglo-Saxonist who's very interested in focusing on um, uh, Northern European and Germanic traditions. And we have somebody who has a strong interest in fantasy elements. So they were uh, interested in uh, you know, the Celtic tales, the Arthurian legends, the Mabinogian and so forth. So uh, the class, has a very wide range of readings and uh, you know, depended on what the um, faculty member's interest is. And so I started thinking, well, we can get all that into a single textbook. Uh, once, we, once I learned about OER as a viable resource, I, I started thinking that maybe that was the means by which we uh, created our own textbook, uh, something that could be passed from one faculty member to the next and uh, adapted to uh, suit specific interests. Um, this makes sense, obviously, because again, I'm creating a textbook uh, through the vehicle of press books. And the, um, uh, the textbook is obviously free. And as you might imagine, the course it is, as it's traditionally been de uh, delivered has required a lot of expenses from students. Um, anywhere from 100 to $150 worth of course readings, and that can be as many as six or seven purchases. So uh, this offers a, um, a much more affordable means, uh, and you know that's been a recurring theme throughout the day. We all like to be able to offer our students free textbooks, and um, that's um, you know, one of the great uh, selling features for the class. Um, so, uh, just um, the um, uh, summing up here, uh, I'm always looking, and I'm, I'm a heavy user of D2L. I'm a certified online instructor, so I'm no stranger to pasting links into D2L checklists and telling students, check this out. This is interesting. This relates to the course materials. And um, so, um, you know, I'm, I'm very pleased that the uh, press books edition offers us the opportunity to link to a specific text within an OER textbook and uh, you know take them directly to the reading or even to the section that uh, we want to focus on. Um, so that's uh, one clear benefit. Another one is um, 
that uh, I can be more inclusive with the readings. I can include readings from outside the Eurocentric tradition. Uh, I can talk about uh, some of the alternative traditions, the Islamic tradition, uh, talk about some of the works and key figures there. Um, and some of the more obscure writers uh, can also be featured as long as their uh, readings are online somewhere. So um, it does also serve to enhance the uh, diversity component in a traditionally um, uh, very canonical class, um, you know, a, a class very typically aligned with Western civilization and the, the canonical traditions, we can diversify the offerings a bit. So that makes sense as well. And uh, I did get a good piece of advice from uh, Erica Stone, who's been, uh, been kind enough to share her uh, insights with me. I am developing the online class and she suggested to develop the textbook alongside the class to view them as joint and related projects. So uh, I will be doing that as the summer unfolds. I'm in the very early stages of this process and I've also got some ideas about um, assignments where I ask students to uh, come up with contextual material that they find online and if it, um, if it works well within the textbook itself, I can uh, fit it in and make it a part of um, uh, the, the textbook, which is not a, a fixed entity, which can certainly grow and change and uh, adapt and be adapted for other faculty members who might have their own ideas about how to teach the course. So uh, I guess my last slide is uh, just the um, not particularly visible, so apologies for that, but that's basically what I've got so far. I'm learning how to, um, uh, to get web addresses. Uh, a lot of the texts I'm using are already online and have been for quite a while through uh, organizations like the Gutenberg Project and the Hadithi Trust and some of the other repositories for canonical literary texts. Uh, all I have to do is uh, figure out how to organize and uh, how to uh, divide the textbook into uh, meaningful sections. And then I can uh, you know, begin gathering texts. And um, you know, uh, that's really the project that I'm looking at uh, as the summer unfolds. So with that, I see I'm uh, a minute over my allotted time. So I will stop there. Thank you for hearing me out. You're fine, Warren. We were kind of a little off order. So if you need to add a couple more statements, that's fine. Uh, let's see. Um, I think I'm out of statements. Um, I'll just reiterate that, uh, um, you know, in, in the research that I do in my academic work, it does require a pretty, you know, extensive amount of um, uh, looking for original texts online. And, you know, that also helped me um, uh, realize that, uh, OER, an OER textbook was the way to go with this, especially once I kind of concluded that, um, you know, there wasn't much out there for a class like this uh, in terms of a single textbook. And always, um, you know, students in, in the past decade, at least, have always been required to buy multiple textbooks, and that's always a problem as well. So putting it all in one place and getting it to them um, through a D2L checklist, uh, that just simplify as a number of things. So. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. I, I had a, a question about that and then we'll actually open it up to more questions. Uh, and Suzanne might have similar question in this, but with both of us just finishing that Creative Commons certificate, one of the big pushes is the GLAM movement, which is galleries, libraries, art, museums. Um, have you noticed an increase in some of those literature options becoming available freely online with that push? Some of the um, especially obscure authors and articles and things. I'm generally able to find just about anything that I need. Okay. Um, and what I think is um, interesting is the, um, you know, the contextual materials, which can explain, for example, how uh, a Greek or Roman poet became important to later medieval poets. Um, you know, or you know, just a, a basic website where some 
interested collector has done some work that's useful for the context of the class. Um, I, I'm not so familiar with the glam movement, but um, I think we're, we're looking at a similar kind of uh, dynamic here. So. That's awesome, thank you. Uh, Cheryl also asked about choosing a translation, um, like yeah. the new translations of the Iliad, for instance. Yeah, that, that's one of the um, potential drawbacks. Um, I'm doing a project right now that requires looking at the Song of Roland. Ah. And Gutenberg happens to have three or four different translations. So if there's any, um, I mean, you're not dealing with the latest, uh, most authoritative translation. I did notice that Seamus Haney's Beowulf is <coughs> excuse me, available online. Um, and there's some other reputable translations, but there's also some that fall short a little bit. So that's one of the, um, <coughs> I suppose, one of the uh, potential pitfalls, um, you know, if you're stuck with a bad translation. And I realize that when you're dealing with a, a physical text in a classroom, one of the things that the instructor likes is the commentary on the text that might be in the critical edition or whatever. And so we're kind of, um, uh, you know, working without that or working with some, some uh, translations that might be a bit dated. But um, I think the, the means of um, asking students to supply the contextual material might offer a, um, um, and, and, you know, being able to, compare one translation to the next. I think yes. that that is a potential exercise as a useful, ex, useful exercise as well. So, you know, there are some ways around that, but obviously we're not going to be getting the most authoritative translation of the Iliad. We'll be getting the one that, uh, you know, might be 50 or 60 or 80 years old. And, you know, you can use the uh, D2L checklist to link students to the more recent versions and show them that this is uh, an active and ongoing process, that these texts um, you know, do get renewed attention every 20, 30, 40 years um, because the, the messages are still seen as important, so. Cool, very cool, thank you. Thanks, Warren. Does anybody You're else have welcome. questions for Warren? Anybody? I think that we are now to the general question and answer portion of our activity. So here we are ready to chat about anything that anybody has questions about with OER or resources or any anything we can answer about um, the grant or upcoming activities or anything like that. And we have it noted that we'll be doing a presentation on Creative Commons at some point in the very near future. Uh, and and maybe an entire academy on OER because that sounds like fun too. <laughs> Kim, I was just going to ask that. Um, I found it really helpful. I know you scheduled at, uh, and I can see that I'm not alone with this. Uh, I would love to be a part of something like that. Maybe two or three workshops over the course of the summer where we can just sort of workshop our own. OER projects. I think that might be um, helpful just to, you know, for those of us who are still finding our way with this, uh, just being able to share ideas and commiserate might be, that might be a very, very helpful resource. <laughs> Commiserating is key, actually. <laughs> um, I just, I just wanted to mention, and I, I said this a few weeks ago at Rebecca's workshop, it's you know, just, I, I wish, I wish we could give you guys another grant so y'all could work out all the kinks and everything, but I, I, I feel like you guys are the, you know, the movers and shakers and who, like you were saying, bit off more than you can chew and work through it. And um, I, I, I feel like we, we owe you so much for all the work you've put into this um, for helping students and for pushing your work forward. And I, I hope you find wonderful colleagues to collaborate with um, at your at your conferences because you guys are doing amazing work and um, I, I 
you know, can tell you care deeply about your students and your fields because the work is above and beyond what this grant could provide for you, I know. But I, I hope it can continue. I hope that between the library and MTSU online and things we're building, we can build a better infrastructure of support over time too, and that you will keep asking us when things aren't working or don't make sense and we can see what we can do to help. I think I do, I, I do worry that this is this project will completely burn people out. You don't have to say if you're one of those people who are like can't face OER after this. <laughs> but um I hope you get a break and, and we can come back at it. I like the idea of having a few workshops to for those of us who are still working on things. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Suzanne. What other questions or ideas or things do people have? I think we need to make this stuff available to all the new faculty so that if they don't already know about OER, which they might, depending on where they're coming from, um, they are integrated into our efforts from the get go. So they understand that it's important to our students, it's important to the institution. Um, we're getting ready to present to the Board of Trustees again, um, you know, after about three years. And the newbies need to know about this. So it's on my list. I don't, any, anybody else got any other questions? Because we are actually done with our slide deck. So it's really y'all's needs and what, what you want or need from us. We're here to support you. Oh, I forgot to say that the uh, the the person that was the most hurt with us switching over was our textbook rep. <laughs> um, we need to send him a fruit basket or something. Um, he said, uh, "Who who's in charge of the OER? How can I get a hold of them?" And I said, "No, don't. <laughs> you don't. You don't need to. <laughs> it's not going to change." That's great. <laughs> I love that. I definitely applied for like a teaching award this year and didn't even think about until after I submitted everything that the person, the organization sponsoring it was actually a textbook company. And I was like, oh, I should not have included the OER staff. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> Great. Oh, yeah, it's Cheryl. I love that. But um, Barnes & Noble is actually on campus is really big on on OER um, and have done some things to help support that in terms of when you complete the textbook information for a new semester that instead of just saying you don't have a textbook or you do have a textbook and this is what it is, you can actually say I am not using a print textbook because it is an OER class and it will actually be designated that way um, when students go to look for textbooks. So that part's pretty nice, pretty helpful. And it's supposed to be an attribute and banner that can be searched as well. I think we ran into a little glitch with that, but it should still be added um, and they'll be coming, figuring out the best process to make that happen moving forward. So it's constantly there. So if somebody wanted to, they could search for classes that are OER and even make some decisions about classes that they register for based on that. Mm -hmm. ah, the glitch has been solved. Okay, good. 
And I, I'm a nervous light, but just quickly, I'm, I'm the acquisitions librarian at Walker, in case any of you don't know. But I mean, slowly and, and surely, these times are changing. Um, I think we, MIT has a direct to open program now. So instead of buying MIT ebooks, libraries like pitch in money. But then what we get instead of an ebook set is open access ebooks for everyone. Um, Knowledge Unlatch is doing that, University of Michigan's doing that. More and more publishers are realizing that this is this is happening and uh they're they're finding ways to use their funding to make things open instead of using their funding to make you know proprietary ancillary materials and um, so it's never fast enough but i think slowly that the publishers will come around a little some of them we can hope Uh, we can, I guess, probably at this point, um, stop our recording um, mm -hmm. and we can stop our share. Uh, and then if people have additional questions that you didn't want to 